morning, dear listener. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. This is your breakfast show here until nine o'clock. I'm worried because I'm feeling a little bit too perky for this time of the morning, which, which could only mean I've peaked way too early. That's going to be terrible. By half past seven, I could be absolutely shattered and we could be in a terrible state of affairs. So let's see how we go. Loads coming up on the show this morning. We will be talking about paying cash in hand. Do you do it? We've all done it, haven't we? Haven't we? Have you done it? If you have, 08459 455 555. You can give me a call and let me know. Uh, the EastEnders. We'll be discussing the EastEnders television show. <laughs> yeah. Did you see it last night? I'm not a fan. I, I, I have to lay my cards on the table. I'm not a massive fan of EastEnders. Did you see it with the, the torch and all of that nonsense going on? Uh, Olympic travel. Now, listen. Also, I'd be really keen to talk to you if you went to the rehearsal of the Olympic opening ceremony last night. I know you can't tell me what happened, and I don't want you to tell me what happened. I just want to know thumbs up or thumbs down. That's all I want to know. I don't want to know the specifics of it, because it's a secret, and I'm looking forward to the secret. But did you enjoy it? That's all I want to know. 08459 455 555. All of that and more between now and nine. Call 08459. Four double five five double five. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. BBC Three Counties Radio. You can text as well, 81333, start your text 3CR, or email 3CR at bbc.co.uk. Speak to you after this, soft sale, tainted love. Good morning, this is BBC Three Counties Radio. It's eight minutes past six, just coming up to now. Woburn-based golfer Ian Poulter has been hosting his seventh in- invitational tournament at the Buckinghamshire Golf Club. A hundred rising junior stars from across the UK, including the three counties, took part yesterday and got hands-on tips from Ian himself, who finished tied ninth at the Open. Our reporter Tony Fisher spoke to some of those involved. So no, no pressure on this tee no shot pressure. now. You've got cameras, Ian Poulter's right. here. Going to be a great day. What, you, what, what sort of score are you looking forward to? Well, like today, like today? I'm playing off ten, so all around level, my handicap. Take anything on the par, definitely. Yeah. Great. And that, how old are you? I'm 17, 17, so yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Good score out there. Bit breeze, but should be good. And are you looking to turn professional? Maybe one day, maybe one day, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. And what, what sort of an opportunity does this give you playing in the Ian Poulter Invitational? Oh, it's great. It's great to see, obviously, young, some really good golfers, really good ex- tournament experience, playing on championship course. So it's just just really good experience for the future. Yeah. So, yeah. And being with Ian, have he, has he given you any tips yet or not yet? Maybe later. I showed you a tip yesterday when I hold me second shot on oh, two. Yeah, he was, Aidan was there to watch it. Yeah. He, was, he was at the Open. Yeah, at the uh, open. Followed me round the golf course and mm. um, he was there to see the ball drop in the hole. So... Uh, there's a good tip. Just work on yeah. your yeah. course management, work on your yardage, work on your practice and just you know, make the odd eagle every now and then and a few yeah. birdies. Easy. And hold your second shot. Easy, eh? Easily done. Easily done, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hoping, hoping for a few birdies today? Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully for drive ball well. Then just put in, put yeah. in nice green, so hopefully. What do you think of his game, Ian? I think Aiden. he's come on leaps and bounds. I mean, I've seen Aidan play <clears throat> the last... Uh, last couple of years I think it'd be great to see him uh, out there playing today uh, he's grown a lot and um, you know, hopefully uh, his golf games come on so look forward to seeing some good shots from him today What's your one tip for Aidan do you think on the way you know he plays? To go out there and enjoy it today I, I, know, I know he'll enjoy it uh, he's, he's had a good uh, time up at the golf I know he's tired he got up at half four this morning to uh, drive down this morning to play so if, you know, for, for me if uh, he goes out there plays well and enjoys himself that's uh, that's great. Hopefully you can get in the prizes. Yeah. But travel, that's all part of being a professional golfer, isn't definitely, it? Definitely, definitely, yeah. Get used to it, hopefully. Maybe one day. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, good drive. Just right at that bunker. That's perfect. Very nice. Back right pin position, so that'll uh, you'll have a nice angle in from down there. You enjoying the Ian Poulter Invitational? Is this your first time? Yes, it's my first time. Yeah. What's your name? Uh, Ethan Cambridge. OK. How's it going? Um, it's a very tough course, I think, and I'm struggling a little off the distances, but I'm playing OK. And has Ian spoken to you yet or given uh, you any yeah. tips? Ian's come round and given us a, a helping hand on the greens and how to read them and just keep your head, yeah. keep going. They're hard greens, aren't they? Yeah. Quite a lot of borrow. Yeah, a lot of borrow. 
And w- what do you hope to take from here? Do you want to eventually turn professional? Uh, yes, I hope to turn professional in the future. And uh, just to give me a bit of confidence, really. And days like this are really important, aren't they? Yeah, they're really important. And they give you a boost in the future. Yeah. What's your handicap? Seven. Seven. Right, OK. Well, best of luck. Thank you. Thanks very much, mate. Cheers. I'd love to be good at golf, but it just looks, it looks so hard, doesn't it? It just looks ridiculously hard. You've got to get a ball 500 yards into a tiny hole. Crazy golf. Now, there's a game. Huh? Hey, here's something in uh, page seven of the mail. Um, <clears throat> there's one of these Olympic, uh, Olympic Supremo, Jacques Rog. I don't know how you pronounce that. Rog? Roger? There's two Gs. I, mean, I guess that makes it a hard G. Anyway. Um, he's wearing a £10,000 gold watch. Uh, he's staying in five-star hotels. And he describes himself... As working class. Is he? This is an interesting thing, isn't it? What, what, are you working class, even if you've got lots and lots of money? Does it depend on what your parents were, uh, or, or, or where you came from? Or is it dependent on where you are now? Because I guess I kind of grew up working class. I'm not working class. I, I wouldn't, I, I'm middle class now, I think, aren't I? I would have I thought so. Oh, eight four five nine. Four double five, five double five. Can we just get a little tally on the listeners this morning? Do you consider yourself to be working class, middle class? We won't have any upper class people listening to this nonsense. You'll be, you'll be listening to Radio 4. I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, but uh, can you be working class even if you've got loads of money? This guy is, uh, is staying in five-star hotels. Uh, this is on the Radio 4 programme on Today. Um, yesterday he was saying uh, that he's got a £10,000 gold watch. He has tea with the Queen at Buckingham Palace. Night at the Opera, back to the Hilton in London's Park Lane, where a nightcap of fine cognac can cost guests £695. Can he really be working class under those circumstances? 08459 455 555. What determines what class you are? Is it the amount of money you have? It can't be just the money, is it? Because you can see dead common people with money. Really horrible dead common... Blah, that have got a lot of money. Uh, it, does it, is it your job? Is it where you live? Is it who your parents are? Who you're married to? 08459 455 555. What determines the class you are? And can you shift within that framework? Can you go... I would imagine it's easier to go upwards in the scale than it is to go downwards. That's kind of the natural trend of society, isn't it? We're all aiming upwards. So it would make more sense that you go from working class to middle class. I would suspect that that's the transition that that my family made. It's easier to do that than it is to go back the other way. 08459 455 555. What makes you the class you are and can you change? Or maybe you think that we are living in a classless society. That's what we're told, isn't it? It's a classless society now. Does it, class doesn't exist. I'm not sure if that's true. You can text as well. Uh, let me know what class you are. I want to get a, kind of like a, a, a little tally of uh, who's listening to this show. 81333. Start your text. 3CR. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio with your headlines on Tuesday the 24th of July. Commuters in the three counties are being told today to prepare travel plans ahead of the Olympics, which start on Friday. Train company First Capital Connect are predicting delays despite over 760,000 extra seats and the Harts County showground at Redbourne will be a park and ride for game spectators. A Hertfordshire MP and Conservative Treasury Minister has accused householders who pay tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong. South West Hearts MP David Gork says such arrangements are helping people to avoid paying tax. And we'll be talking about that later on in the show. In sport... In last night's football friendlies, Luton won 2-0 at St Albans and Milton Keynes Dons won 2-0 in Ireland against St James's Gate. We'll have a full weather bulletin in a few minutes. And coming up, as the countdown to the Olympic Games is now just a matter of days, many of us will be planning our routes in and out of the capital. Next, we'll hear how one career company from the three counties are preparing. Um, See, I like Roberto. I've met him a couple of times. He's a nice guy, but that trailer makes me very, very uncomfortable. He's obviously... There's something... 
there's something wrong there, and, and wrong in the worst sense of the word. Roberto, uh, seriously, you can get help for that, and I thoroughly recommend you do. I, re- I seriously recommend. Let's have a look at the front pages, shall we, before we, um, uh, we get the latest weather. I can tell you the weather is nice. There you go. Uh, the Daily Telegraph. Uh, it is. Mo- oh, this is the story we're talking about later on. Uh, David Cork, I think, is coming onto the show. Um, it is morally wrong to pay tradesmen cash in hand. Treasury Minister says homeowners who allow workmen to avoid tax force others to pay more. What do you think about that? I'm really keen to get your thoughts on that. Uh, have you done it? We've, we've all done it at some point, haven't we? Even if it's like a, a 20 quid to the guy that comes and trims, you know, the, the hedge at the front of your garden. How bad is it? I mean, have you done it for big things, like getting building work, cash in hand? 08459 four double five five double five. You can text if you'd rather. I understand why this may be a slightly sensitive issue for some of you. 81333 3CR. By the way, I'm not in any way condoning this sort of behaviour. I just, you know, we're, we're grown up enough to have an adult discussion about whether you do it or not. And whether you do think it is um, d- destroying the nation by not paying that tax. Is it morally wrong? Uh, and there's also a picture on the Telegraph of Chris Hoy. Four-time Olympic gold medalist Sir Chris Hoy will carry the flag for Team GB at the opening ceremony. It was confirmed yesterday. Um, the Guardian. G4S staff cheat on tests to run X-ray scanners at games. Oh, man, G4S are back in the news. Who'd have thunk it? Recruits given several chances to pass exams on bomb detection but just 20 minutes training on machines. The credibility of the Olympic security operation being run by G4S is called into further question today by claims that scores of trainees are being allowed to cheat their way through tests for the X-ray machines that detect bombs. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, The Times and loads of other newspapers have got pictures on the front of uh, James Holmes, uh, who killed 12 and injured 58 uh, in a shooting in a Colorado cinema. The Times also has fury over serious threat to use chemical weapons. Uh, And this is also on some of the front pages. I don't quite understand the excitement around this. But Prince Harry, the millionaire prince, has got tickets to the volleyball, beach volleyball. Shock horror. Who'd have thunk it? He's going to have such a good time. Uh, The Independent, uh, similar stories. Uh, Syria raises the spectre of chemical weapons. Assad regime will use uh, WND against threats from abroad. Uh, more pictures of uh, James Holmes in court uh, and phone hacking criminal trial decisions today. We, we, we might be touching on this later on, that um, the Leveson inquiry is coming to an end. And we get to find out exactly uh, what that is. Uh, the Daily Mail, uh, paying a cleaner uh, cash in hand is morally wrong, David Gork said yesterday. It's morally repugnant. Have you done it? Have you done it? A, a cleaner... Was it 20, 30 quid a week? You're not going to get them to give you an invoice and do the tax and the VAT on that. Are you? Are you? Oh, wait, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. Uh, the Daily Express, Euro chaos, chaos to wreck pensions. It's a pension story today from the Express. It's either pensions, immigration or uh, mortgages. Today it's pensions. £29 billion wiped off shares in new turmoil. The Sun, Joker in the dock. Uh, more of James Holmes. Uh, in quite America, I'm afraid, dear listener, the, the Daily Mirror is not in yet. So if, you, if you've tuned in just to find out what's happening on the front page of the Mirror, you're going to have to be a little bit more patient. Beds, hearts and bugs, weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Let's get the latest weather now with Dan Holly. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Yeah, another nice day coming up. A clear skies at the moment, uh, 13 or 14 degrees already. So quite a warm start to the day. And really, it's going to stay dry with unbroken sunshine. And by this afternoon, it'll feel quite hot. Top temperatures around 28 or 20. 29 degrees. That's getting into the mid 80s in Fahrenheit. Uh, light southwesterly winds. But with all that sun around, there's a very high risk of sunburn. And also, the pollen today is very high too. This evening and tonight, staying dry, quite warm as well, with long clear skies. Uh, maybe one or two mist and fog patches forming by dawn. Temperatures holding up 14 or 15 degrees. And I think by the end of tonight, it will feel a bit more muggy, so a little bit uncomfortable for sleeping. And that does mean tomorrow looking like another good day. A lot of sunny spells around. Perhaps a bit more on the way of uh, patchy fair weather clouds by the afternoon and temperatures tomorrow similar values 28 29 degrees but feeling a little bit more humid i think by the time we get to tomorrow
tomorrow. And it's staying dry really for Thursday as well. Further sunny spells and feeling very warm. I think for Friday and Saturday, perhaps a chance of one or two showers later on in the day. Uh, but the temperature's starting to come down. I think by the weekend, we're looking at highs of 21 degrees. So it is turning cooler for the weekend, but still a good deal of dry weather for the rest of this week. That's the latest on the weather front. Dan Holly, thank you very much. I did, did listen, get this, right? We're talking about um, having workmen come into your house. I had a plumber in yesterday who I, I paid legitimately because it was quite a big job. Uh, and one of the, the, the things we got wrong with our boiler is that when we turn the hot water on, the radiators come on. So it heats up the house, so that's annoying. So this guy came and he fixed it yesterday and it was fixed. So he put the hot water on in the evening so we could give the kids a bath. Uh, and I forgot to turn the hot water off, which is, is annoying because it's expensive. But I woke up in the middle of the night, like the hottest night of the year so far, all of the radiators were on in the house. It was re- it was so hot. I was there, lying there in bed, sweating, feeling a little bit sick, going, oh, God, this is so hot. Oh, this is so... He's not fixed the blooming radiators. He's not fixed them! So I've got to get him back today. What a pain. 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give me a call now a bedfordshire courier company says that lives could be put at risk if they're not allowed to use the olympic traffic lanes in london Letchworth Couriers Limited, based in Alsley. Alsley? Is that, that's how we say it, yes. Claim they'll face more gridlock and congestion during the games when delivering things like blood samples and medical supplies and say they should be allowed to use these restricted lanes. Our reporter, Brendan Murphy, went to find out more. Hello, my name's Barbara Moss. I'm the finance director of Letchworth Couriers Limited. So you're based up here in Alsley, quite a bit away from central London. Why do you care about the Olympic lanes? Because we have, on a daily basis, around about 20 to 25 drivers going into London, in and out of London all day. Same day courier company. So obviously it's a major impact for us. And and, and how does it affect you practically then, these Olympic lanes? They've come into force um, already, some of them, haven't they? They have indeed, yes. From, I think, believe it was the 12th of July, they started to come into force. I think, obviously, the biggest impact is um, time to make deliveries. That's obviously going to increase. And because we're a same-day courier company, basically, we're sort of ad hoc deliveries. So it's very difficult to pre-plan. Um, Transport for London did have a route planner guide. Um, but when you're doing our kind of deliveries, it's really... On the day, I mean, you heard, you've been into our main office, you've heard how busy the phones are. You've got a deadline for a delivery. What happens if you don't deliver on time? It depends, really, on the nature of the delivery. Obviously, it's the impact on our customers and their customers that is our prime concern. Uh, We do do some urgent sort of medical deliveries into the capital. They can be pharmaceuticals. Uh, We do also do um, blood runs into um, a place near Harley Street. And they obviously have a time, a shelf life, if you like. So it's important to get those in in the right sort of time. And we also do deliveries for another company, which can be parts to go into um, operations, sort of valves for different kinds of operations and things. And there have, in the past, quite frequently been people literally on the operating table when a part has been called for. We store some parts here for them, so we pick them and the driver goes off with them. Um, so if you get something like that, that is not going to fit into the midnight to 6am slot when the route's going to be open. So obviously we have a concern there about how we're going to get in. So when you're delivering some medical t- supplies, do you consider that to be an emergency service worthy of being able to use the Olympic lanes? I think where you've got customers that are providing items for operating um, theatres then I think, yes, where you've got people potentially on the operating table or being prepped to be operated, then I would say that, yes, that would be an emergency service. And what kind of operations are we talking about? Um, I believe there have been heart operations going on. I mean, uh, situations where people have been on the operating table where we've had to get uh, goods into theatres. We have in the past had drivers, you know, they've been... in constant contact with us all the way through from pick-up in Letchworth all the way into the centre of London and where the driver's been, you know, waiting and he's in a queue, he literally just pulled over on the side of the road, got out of the car and ran with it into the hospital, up in, up to the operating theatre and delivered the goods. And on one particular occasion when that occurred, we had a call back later saying, thank you very much, can you let your driver know you helped save a life today? So we are talking important important facilities yeah. it's interesting isn't it would you class that as an emergency uh, service i guess I, I probably would even though it hasn't got the blue lights and the ninor 
Uh, is, I think, and by the way, the Nino is indeed the technical term for the siren that they use. Uh, it, it would be an emergency, wouldn't it? They're literally saving lives. Have you driven into London? Have you been affected by um, the Olympic lanes? A lot of them don't come into action until tomorrow. Uh, but I know that there are a couple. The one on the M4 is, uh, is in operation. I think there are a couple of others that are in operation. Have you seen them? Uh, I drive around the North Circular in London quite a bit, and there is one on a bit of... If I'm going to visit my mum, for example, and then going to go and visit some friends in North London, then there there is a a section of road, a route I do quite regularly, there is a section of road that is a massive, uh, you know, part of the Olympic network. And that is going to be absolute chaos. Now, are you of the opinion that it's just a few weeks, get over it, put up with a little bit of traffic... What's the problem? Or are you furious that your travel arrangements could potentially um, be a nightmare? I- I'm wondering how people are going to get to the Olympics. You can't, you're not going to drive there, are you? That would be ridiculous. Uh, the, the trains and the tubes, really? After last night with the central line, 60,000 people went to the, um, the, the dress rehearsal of the opening ceremony in Stratford. By the way, if you went... Could you give me a call? I don't want to know what you saw, what happened. I just want a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's all. Uh, 60,000 people went. And the central line that was linking that to the rest of London was closed. It wasn't working. How bad was that? What a nightmare that must have been. Oh, wait, 459. Four double five, five double five. If you have been affected already, uh, or you think you're going to be affected by the uh, changes to the travel arrangements in central London, we'll be talking to um, a little bit later on to uh, the Transport for London's director of planning later on in the program about the Olympic lanes and how it could affect you if you're commuting uh, into or out of the capital. So it, it should be quite interesting. So oh eight four five nine, four double five, five double five is the phone number. If you if you're worried that it's going to be affecting you uh, in, in some way. Um, 08459 455 555 81333. Start your text to 3CR. You can also email 3CR at bbc.co.uk. Those are the ways to get in touch with the show. Would be nice to hear from you this morning. Oh, look, there's Terence Trent Darby. Sorry, Terence, we don't have time for that. This is what we meant to play. Blimey. Donna Summer, she's very energetic, isn't she? <clears throat> MacArthur Park. Uh, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio, uh, your breakfast show through till nine o'clock. Now, 60,000 people attended a dress rehearsal uh, last night for Friday's opening ceremony of the London Olympics. If you were there, I'd love to hear from you. Don't want to know the details, because I know it's top secret and I don't want to spoil the secret, but a thumbs up or a thumbs down would be, uh, would be very interesting. Organisers are still trying to keep a secret uh, many of the details about the event, which is expected to be watching, watched by billions worldwide. Our li- uh, Olympic reporter, Jane Prendergast, is here. Good morning, Jane. Good morning. So we're at the dress rehearsal stage for the opening ceremony. Were you there? I wasn't, sadly. No, I'm hoping to be there on Friday, Ooh, but uh, not very nice. the rehearsal next. How did it go last night? Have you, what have you heard? Well, very well by all accounts. So, as you say, you know, it's much anticipated by everyone, heralding the start of the Olympics, which, of course, so long in the planning. And we know some of the details already. We know there are going to be countryside scenes with meadows, real animals, clouds... Um, But, of course, the organisers don't really want the show-stopping surprises to be blown, so they invited 60,000 people to attend (laughs) the dress rehearsal. Yeah, keep it under your hat, please, 60,000, yes. And, yes, and Danny Boyle reportedly addressed the audience and asked them to save the surprise ahead of Friday's showpiece um, and not post any images on social networks. Of course, a lot of people did. Some of them have been taken down and a lot of people talked about detail. We're not repeating any of that, of course. Good. Suffice it to say, people have um, said things like it was epic it made me proud to be british um, a lot of people are talking about the fireworks apparently if you like fireworks you're in for a treat on friday night and someone else said if you have any plans for friday cancel them the opening ceremony is out of this world so quite positive feedback from some of those who were there my next door neighbor went and i'm keen to speak to her later on this afternoon to find out what happened how uh, important is it that the opening ceremony goes without a hitch well, really important. I mean, the IOC president, Jack Rogg, was talking to the BBC yesterday about London, about how he was sure that the organisers had got everything right for a successful Games. But of course, you know, in the run-up, we've had all the concerns about security, the criticisms about Olympic bus lanes, travel, the threat of strike action, and reports yesterday that some people were having to queue for hours to collect tickets that they've booked. 
All these things build a negative picture. If the opening ceremony goes brilliantly and is spectacular, it kind of moves things on from that and can be seen as a great launch pad for the Games. And of course, the organisers are leaving nothing to chance. We know there's going to be another dress rehearsal tomorrow, so more chances for leaks to come out. Um, the thousands of performers are going to get to practice some more. Uh, the Queen will be officially launching the Games on Friday, but she's been entertaining guests already, hasn't she? Yeah, not not just any old guests, though, not not just any old visitors to London. She was hosting reception for more than 100 members of the International Olympic Committee yesterday. And uh, she made a speech. She talked about the importance of the legacy of the Games, and she had this message for those taking part. In the coming days, over 10,000 athletes from more than 200 nations will be undertaking their final preparations following years of dedication, hard work and personal sacrifice. We send our warm wishes to them all for a rewarding and enjoyable Games. And of course her granddaughter Zara Phillips will be taking part uh, as a a member of the equestrian team. And uh, the Queen went on to say that um, the Games was an inspiration to children and communities and she said nowhere has this been more evident than in the warm welcome given to the Olympic torchbearers as the flame has travelled the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. Well now you mentioned the Olympic torch because it, it popped up in EastEnders didn't it last night? Not a programme I watch, I haven't watched it for years because it's utter tosh but it, it was in there wasn't it? Yes, it was quite bizarrely woven into the storyline. There were two episodes of EastEnders last night. The second one was mainly recorded. (laughs) Not great for those who aren't fans. But there was a live eight-minute segment into it. And I kind of agree with you, but I do love it when the soaps do something live. And um, the actor Perry Fennick, who plays Billy Mitchell, looked really nervous as he started off in this uh, eight-minute segment with the torch on his 300-metre run. And, of course, it sped past the Queen Vic. Um, it was really one of those moments where you couldn't quite separate real life and soap fiction. Well, this is the thing that confused me, Jane. Was it actually part of the Olympic relay? or yes. was it, so, so someone, uh, one runner, I, I, I can't separate reality and fiction. So it was actual genuine part of the relay that took place on EastEnders. It, it was, because wow. I remember when we went to the torch lighting in Greece, uh, shortly after that, when it was announced where the torch was going, this was in the schedule. And wow. you could see the people who were accompanying the flame, they were the same people. I saw it go through Hemel Hempstead uh, the other week. Yep. They were the same people who were accompanying it then, uh, the people in the grey tracksuits, the security, and uh, the other people either side of, of Perry Fennick. Um, I don't think they were celebrities. They, it just looked as though they got lucky and happened to take part in the soap as well. Jane, uh, thank you very much there. That's uh, Jane Prendergast, who's um, our, our Olympic reporter. We'll be hearing more about uh, that over the next couple of weeks. Did you see the EastEnders last night? I'm, n- I'm not a fan at all. My wife used to watch it, and thank God she has, has come to her senses. I used to be obsessed with Coronation Street. I used to be obsessed with it. I used to Sky Plus it, series link it. I came back from a, a, a two-week holiday once, and uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I watched nine episodes of Coronation Street back-to-back. I know, it was like watching three really good movies. Get this right. So I watched nine episodes of Coronation Street back-to-back, so I'm, I'm kind of a little bit, you know, out of it on Coronation Street. And then I went to my uh, local supermarket, and Dev from Coronation Street was stood right in front of me. It blew my mind. It was like I'd walked into the television and was living a rather sad, pathetic dream. <laughs> oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Did you see uh, the EastEnders last night? I, I kind of do like the live ones. One of the last live ones they did, I did watch, and one of the actors muffed up his lines. You could see him stumbling, and it was brilliant. And, it, and you could see all the others like going, oh, my God, he's messed up his lines. What do we do? And a professional. It may have been even been uh, Perry Fennick stepped in and, and, and filled the breach. Oh dear. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. These are the headlines this morning on uh, Tuesday the 24th of July on BBC Three Counties Radio. Commuters in the three counties are being told to prepare travel plans ahead of the Olympics which start on Friday. Train company First Capital Connect are predicting delays despite over 760,000 extra seats and the Hearts County showground at Redbourne will be a park and ride for game spectators. A Hertfordshire MP and Conservative Treasury Minister has accused householders who paid tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong. South West Hearts MP David Gork says such arrangements are helping people to avoid paying tax. 
In sport, in last night's football friendlies, Luton won 2-0 at St Albans and Milton Keynes Dons won 2-0 in Ireland against St James's Gate. In your weather across beds, hearts and bucks, dry with long spells of unsp- unbroken sunshine and feeling hot once again. The day's maximum temperature, 29 degrees Celsius. Coming up, cash in hand. Surely, at one point, loads of us have either paid or been paid cash in hand for work. Is it such a bad thing? Our reporter joins us next to tell us more. Good morning, dear listener. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Let's have a little bit of this, shall we? Gary Barlow and the Military Wives. Sing. There are two shows getting a right royal pasting in all the papers <clears throat> today. This Jesus Christ superstar, superstar thing. Have you seen this? I've not seen it. It's on every night of the week, is it? That's it. This is the Andrew Lloyd Webber trying to find Jesus. Now, that I would actually watch, but he's trying to find it for his musical. Uh, and it's on every night, and it's a weird mix of judges. D- Dawn French, Jason Donovan, and Mel C. Now, while I like all of those people individually, apart from one, I'm not saying which one. Uh, well, I'm, you know, it's... Uh, oh, Mel C is Mary Magdalene in it, apparently. There you go, you see. Fantastic. It's on every single night, and it goes on for hours, apparently. That, how, how much can you drag this up? Also, The Voice uh, is getting a pasting because there was an a- audition, uh, and only six people turned up for the audition for the next series. Well, then, haven't we had enough of these things? I hate those kind of programmes. I, I don't watch Britain's Got Talent or The X Factor because the first few weeks... It's just mentally ill people, isn't it? It is. The X Factor in particular. It's just mentally ill people, vulnerable people, who shouldn't be on TV being laughed at. That's what we're doing, isn't it? And I find it very... I used to enjoy it, and then it it, it dawned on me that's what it was. It's vulnerable people that we should be protecting, and we're all pointing our finger and laughing. They're going, ha ha, look at that idiot. I just, I don't enjoy them at all. And really, you know, what have they given us? Will Young. That's it. That's all it's given us. Will Young. Leona Lewis didn't do anything. Liberty X. That's all we've had. Hmm? Girls Aloud. Well, yeah. You, you put it like that, it makes it even more pointless. Oh, wait. Four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. My uh, six o'clock peak has, uh, has peaked. And I'm, I'm on the downward slide now. Uh, right. Where are we? Yes. Ah, no, of course, this is very interesting. Have you ever paid a builder, plumber or electrician in cash? Well, you are morally wrong if you do so, according to the Treasury Minister, David Gork. He's told the BBC that by paying tradesmen this way, it encourages tax avoidance. When a tradesman says, here's a 10%, 20% discount on your bill if you pay me cash in hand... That is facilitating the hidden economy. That's as big a problem in terms of loss to the exchequer as tax avoidance. That is meaning that revenue isn't being paid that should be paid. If people do do that, they have to do so with the recognition that that means that taxes will be higher for the rest. Well, let's get a word on this from our reporter, Gavin Lee. Good morning, Gavin. Oh, Gavin, where are you? Are you there? I can hear you loud. I can hear you now, sir. Thank you very much. Sorry, my fault. Uh, Why is the Treasury Minister saying this? Well, he was dispatched, I think, by the Treasury to talk about a new policy. When it comes to celebrities, the super rich, people using tax avoidance schemes like K2, where... In ordinary circumstances, if you're earning a substantial amount, you can you know, go from 50% tax to potentially 2% tax, providing you pay this company. Say, what he was saying was, if they do this system, they can be referred to the HMRC um, to then look into the details and whether they can claw back some more money. But he was asked specifically about um, tradesmen and whether it's right to be, for them to be paid cash in hand. First on Newsnight, then he was asked by a number of newspapers, and he said specifically, for you and I, for anybody listening, for the employer to be paying a tradesman cash in hand. They are morally wrong. Well, actually, um, the legal requirement is not on us, is not on the the employer, it's on the tradesmen themselves to declare the money. If they don't declare the money, then it is illegal, then it's tax evasion. But it's interesting that he's very much putting this as an issue of conscience and saying, you know, people should be thinking about this uh, from, from a point of view of what they should be owing the government. I would imagine that most people... You know, don't care about this if they're saving money. Is this likely to lead to a government clampdown on cash in hand payments? What's the Treasury saying about that? Well, it's interesting. I, I don't think it will. I spoke to a, a Treasury spokesman this morning who said it's not a policy change. He was answering a specific qu- question, but I think given that he's repeated it so often to newspapers, to different media, um, the message is clearly intended to make, make people think twice. He also said that you know, th- this wink wink policy of give us a discount and knowing that somebody will get their VAT off, they are in implicit in that and also 
the HMRC recently pointed out that people that act this way, and it's pretty common because there was a recent um, survey by um, the Federation for Builders that said 92% of builders work this way, only accepting cash in hand. Wow. And the HMRC said it's a, about a lack of honesty and integrity from the uh, the employer themselves because if the builder's asking for a payment this way, then he or she could be prepared to take shortcuts on the job itself too. Some will say, that why is he targeting those at the lower rung of the pay scale? What about targeting, yeah. targeting the super rich who avoid paying tax? Well, I think he opens himself up to exposure to be, you know, for criticism there. I, I've just come back from a week staring at the super yachts in, in Monaco, and, you know, tax havens like that is what the governments are, are saying are losing us big cash, and, and why not tackle those? I mean, I, there was a recent report again uh, this week. It's all coming at the same time. So anything to do with tax seems to be really, you know, hitting uh, the public, um, knowledge at the moment. £21 trillion pounds is apparently the, the amount globally stashed away through um, by the super rich in tax havens. Massive amount. And actually, the government has put a figure on the amount of money disappearing through tradesmen not declaring how much they're being paid. £2 billion. But I can't qu- quite work out, Ian, I'm not sure if you can, how you come up with that figure if you don't know how it gets there in the first place. There are companies as well, it's probably worth me mentioning, who are aghast at this and say it's perfectly legitimate for some companies to be paid cash in hand. Uh, this is Shabazz Hussain from Accountancy Advantage. For a builder, cash really does make a difference. I've got a number of builders as my clients, and they almost certainly declare everything that they need to declare, but cash really helps them because they have to go out and buy supplies. And if you don't have cash in your bank account because you're waiting for a check to clear, how do you go out and get the supplies that you need, the timber that you need, the slate that you need to do the work that you're doing? You need the cash. I'm going to ask a really stupid question, Gavin. I don't know what a trillion is. Is that like a billion billion? A million billion? Gavin's disappeared. The thought of having such a, 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 a big maths question thrown at him is terrifying. Gavin Lee, thank you very much. I don't, is that a silly question? No, it's not that silly. What's a tr- what is a trillion? There's 21 trillion pounds that's floating around that's not being paid in tax. 08459 455 555. I want a brainy person to call up and tell me. Or you can text 81333. It's like your text 3CR. What's a, what on earth is a trillion? Also, on a slightly more serious note, very keen to get your uh, opinion on paying cash in hand. Do you do it? Do you do it for smaller things and not bigger things? Do you do it for everything? I mean, the, the building work is, is the obvious classic uh, one where people pay cash in hand and they don't avoid paying, uh, they avoid paying VAT. 08459 455 555. What do you think? Or do you think that the government should be targeting these huge companies? that don't pay tax, that avoid tax legally, but they avoid paying millions, billions of pounds in tax. Hopefully get your views after uh, some of this. Loads coming up in the next hour of the show. We will be talking more about paying cash in hand. Do you do it? Do you approve on it or do you frown on it? Uh, More about the Olympic travel and we'll be discussing the controversial Archimedes screw after the latest news and sport with Simon Oxley. It's four minutes past seven. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. It's a very, very nice day out there. Doesn't it make things a little bit easier when it's lovely? It was a fantastic drive into work this morning. It looked great. Coming up in the next hour of the show, paying cash in hand. More on that after a, a minister has said that it's morally wrong if you pay cash in hand. Have you done it? Do you do it or do you frown on it? Do you think it's just the worst thing you can do? Maybe you're a builder or a, a worker that's done work for cash in hand. You think there's nothing wrong with it? There's all these big companies that are avoiding paying millions of pounds in tax. Why should you have to suffer? 08459 455 555 is the phone number. Uh, We'll be talking more about the Olympic travel. How do the changes to the uh, Olympic network in London affect you here in Beds, Hearts and Bucks? Uh, And we'll be talking as well about the uh, Archimedes screw. You can uh, text if you want, 813 double three eight one three double three start your text 3cr you can email 3cr at bbc.co.dk but to be honest i'd rather you called in call 08459 four double five five double five oh eight four five nine four double five five double five bbc three counties radio So, with the controversial Olympic lanes set to open all over London from tomorrow, the focus will be on how the capital's roads cope with the increased Olympic traffic. But what do the London Games mean for drivers in beds, hearts and bucks? Well, with provisions for increased traffic flows being made around the three counties, we sent our reporter, Sophie Soleria, to check out the park and ride being organised at the Hearts County Showground. 
Right, I've just got out after driving up the Dunstable Road from St Albans and I have now arrived at the Harts County Showground. All the way up the Dunstable Road, yellow signs indicating that the ground would be becoming a park and ride for the Olympics were placed maybe 100 metres apart from each other, clearly stating that from the 27th of July to the 12th of August, Harts County Showground will be becoming a place for people to park and take the bus to the Games. I'm now standing by the entrance of the showground, which at present is closed and locked but from Friday will open its gates to customers wishing to use the service and from where I stand now looking out onto the ground the gravel path leading right up to the showground is marked either side by pink signs with white writing stating Hart County Showground park and ride for the Olympics information clearly display your permit which means that you obviously have to buy that before you park and ride. I can't get onto the ground but from where I can stand the warm weather we've had in the past few days has dried up the land although we don't really know how soggy the ground is from the previous months of rain and indeed what the weather will be like in the coming month for the Olympics but for the meantime the grass is looking drier and it actually it looks like a really quite well organized service that they're offering but let's ask some local people what they think and if they feel that the provisions for the Olympic Games and the travel are adequate I've just stopped you, sir, on the side of the Dunstable Road. Are you local to Hertfordshire? Yes, yes. What do you think about the park and ride option at the Harts County Showground? I think it's quite a good option, really, because it's close to the motorway. And really, once you start going any further into London, where else is there? Do you think the traffic is going to be an issue? I think most of it will be actually what's coming off of the M1 and because it's only within a few hundred yards of the M1 I, don't, I can't see that it should be a problem. Although we've had lovely weather the last few days we're hoping that the ground isn't too waterlogged for the yeah. cars. That could be an issue if it does get waterlogged you, obviously it's going to churn up. You've got a Land Rover here which is quite a yeah. substantial car. Would you be concerned about this maybe sinking? No, after? not at all, no. <laughs> I'd be one of the ones that's towing everybody else off. <laughs> I haven't got any problem with the traffic, as long as traffic is able to move. Do you drive a lot for your job? I do drive a lot. Right now, I think I was here last week on Thursday. I came through this road, I think, because of the roadworks that they had just down the road. Traffic was going all the way up to this end. And I'm thinking, OK, if it's going to be put up as a Olympic whatever, how are they going to manage the traffic? I mean, can you imagine? I've also looked at uh, situations where they have shows and stuff like that. Traffic becomes a bit of a nightmare. If they've put this as an Olympic whatever park and right. ride, I don't know what that is going to be like. That was our reporter, Sophie Soleria, at the Park and Ride being organised by Harts County Showground for the Olympics. Well, what about commuters travelling into London during the 2012 Games? Andrew Long is from the Bedford Commuters Association and joins us now on the phone. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. Drivers are being advised not to commute into London if they can help it, but how well do you think the rail network will fare during the Games? Well, they've gone to a lot of preparation beforehand. They're saying they hope to have most trains in their fleets operational. Uh, certainly on the Thameslink on the first Cup and Neck route I think they're hoping all services will at least be 8 car trains and the ones that are 12 car will remain 12 car and I think they've requested um, drivers and other key operational staff not to take annual leave either during the Olympics or the Paralympics so I believe they've put everything in place that they possibly can and of course they've got some good fare offers too they've got some super off peak fares uh, to go to the Olympics, which I think are 20% cheaper than uh, their normal fares. So I think they've gone to a lot of trouble to try and uh, match the demand. You've got a, a few tips for people in the three counties travelling into London about how to avoid the jam-packed stations and get to where they want to more easily, haven't you? Well, on our route, we have the option of going via West Hampstead and onto the London Overground, for example, to Stratford. And on the Great Northern route, they have the option of doing the same via Highbury and Islington. And that may well avoid the problems at St Pancras with going on to the Olympic javelin trains to Stratford or indeed onto the underground. You can actually physically get to some of these venues without touching the underground at all. 
I, I'm, I want this to be a success, of course I do, but I'm so worried it's going to be one of those things where it goes hideously wrong, and afterwards there'll be an inquiry that lasts a year, and they'll go, well, there are lessons that can be learnt from this. Do you think it, the, the travel situation is going to be a nightmare, Andrew, or is everything going to be OK? No, I, th- I think, as I say, a lot of planning has gone to, uh, into it beforehand. And just as an example, a lot of the freight container traffic that comes by rail from F- Felixstowe goes by the North London line and on to Wilsdon and then up to the north of the country from there. From Monday, all that traffic is being rerouted via Ely so that the routes through London are freed up for passenger services, primarily for the Olympics. Now, that's got to be good news because, obviously, that won't import any delays into the system. Passenger trains should run fairly reliably. So I think the rail industries work very hard to see delivery. Andrew, thank you very much. Andrew Long is from the Bedford Commuters Association. How, what do you think? You worry, they're just, There's so many things have gone wrong recently. I do worry it's, there's going to be one of those big inquiries and they'll go, well, lessons, lessons have been learnt and this will never happen again. Well, no, get it right this time. Or am I being too negative? Maybe I'm being too negative. I have been accused of that in the past. I do do that. 08459 455. 555 is the telephone number, uh, if you can um, let me know your thoughts on that. There's a thing in the uh, Independent uh, today about the opening ceremony, and we've, we've been talking about that. We might talk about it a bit more. If you went to the rehearsal of the opening ceremony last night, could you give me a call? 08459 455. 555. I don't want to know what happened. I don't want to know the content. I want to know... Thumbs up or thumbs down for the show. And did you manage to get home okay? Because there was a nightmare on the tubes, wasn't there, last night? I think the the central line wasn't working. The only thing I've read in the newspaper about the opening ceremony, and I've read this in the papers, I can say this, I think, 30 Mary Poppins. 30 Mary Poppins. I read that in the paper yesterday, yeah. That, that, That bit I'm looking forward to. Suddenly... I'm interested. Mary Poppins, the film I only saw for the first time six months ago. I've still never, yeah, I've still never seen the end. I don't know what happens at the end. I just, I watch it with my boy. uh, And for some reason, I've only seen the beginning. I've seen the beginning now a million times. But I've not seen the end. Oh, I'm hoping it has a happy ending. I do hope it, I hope it does. I do hope it does. But there's a thing in The Independent today. Uh, Danny, uh, what's, what's his guy? I always get his name right. Danny Boyle, who is, you know, organised and directed <clears throat> and staged the opening ceremony. Danny Boyle sets out to silence Hugh Edwards in War of Words. <clears throat> so basically, Danny Boyle has said to the BBC, and specifically to Hugh Edwards, when you are showing my opening ceremony on the telly, I do not want you talking over it. I don't want any commentary from you, Edwards. Because you'll ruin it. I want this to be presented as I see it being presented, with, without any interruption. Now, part of uh, Mr Boyle's criticism, I think, is the, um, the Jubilee coverage, uh, which came in for a lot of flack. I didn't see a lot of it, because for various reasons my little boy was in hospital, so I missed most of it, uh, although I was quite looking forward to it. But the bits I did see, uh, particularly on the BBC, but other stations did this as well, it did feel a little bit dumbed down. I know it's a phrase that's bandied around quite a lot, but it did feel a little bit dumbed down. Some of it was excellent on the BBC, don't get me wrong, it wasn't all like that. But when you've got um, uh, Fern Cotton talking about jelly moulds or something to uh, Paloma Faith, you kind of think, really? Really? So I think this is what Danny Boyle's worried about, is that, that they're going to dumb down his thing. What do you think? Should the, should the BBC be doing a commentary, or should we see it? as the performance it is, I kind of think, you know, if, if Danny Boyle, is, 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 who is an excellent film director, he knows what, what people want and what people can understand and references that people will get. Why don't we have it as it is intended to be? Maybe you press your red button now if you want Hugh Edwards talking to you. That might be the way forward. 08459 four double five five double five beds hearts and bugs news bbc three counties radio these are your headlines this morning on tuesday the 24th of july on bbc three counties radio commuters in the three counties are being told to prepare travel plans ahead of the olympics which start on friday train company first capital connect are predicting delays despite over 760,000 extra seats and the hearts county showground at redbourne will be a park and ride base for game spectators A Hertfordshire MP and Conservative Treasury Minister has accused householders who paid tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong. South West Hearts MP David Gork says such arrangements are helping people to avoid paying tax. And we'll be talking about that more on the show in a little bit. In sport... 
in last night's football friendlies, Luton won 2-0 at St Albans and Milton Keynes Dons won 2-0 in Ireland against St James's Gate. There's full sports bulletin in 15 minutes. We'll have weather uh, with Don, uh, sorry, with Dan Holly coming up. And after that, you'll have seen loads in the papers, uh, the continuing coverage of the Leveson Inquiry, which has been investigating press standards. Well, today is the last day. We'll hear the latest next. Always worth a listen. And Jonathan will be in the studio with me in about an hour's time. And I, I really wish that we could record and put out as either like a late night show or a podcast the stuff that he tells me off air. Because it's, it's very, very naughty. It really is very, very naughty, Jonathan Vernon Smith. Uh, we've had some texts. Thank you for that. 81333. You can start your texts at 3CR. Uh, the Olympic travel we're talking about. All this chaos of the Olympics. Security, roads, cost. I'll be so happy when it's all over. Many more feel the same. Well, do you feel the same, dear listener? Are you looking forward to it being over. See, I've, I've kind of come the other way. I was not dead against it, that's a little bit harsh, but I wasn't particularly keen for it and uh, treated it with a certain amount of disdain. But since I saw the torch in Luton the other week, I'm kind of getting... I'm quite excited about it now. I'm getting quite into the idea of it. I'm enjoying all of this. and I'm, Even grumpy old me is going, ah, well, there'll be traffic chaos, but really... You know, come on, we can put up with it, guys. Is that your attitude, or are you sick to death of the Olympics? It's going to get worse. Oh, oh it's going to get worse, I tell you that now. Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Are you sick to death of the Olympics? Uh, this is from Dave in Luton. He also goes on to say, did you fix your lawnmower? Not yet, Dave. I'm going to have a go today. Uh, I've been, it's been suggested I pour boiling water. <laughs> it's a nightmare. I pour boiling water over my nut. Uh, and then I, hopefully I can loosen it. And if that doesn't work, and it, it, it pains me to say it, because there's nothing wrong with the lawnmower, if that doesn't work, I've been instructed by my wife to go and buy a new lawnmower today. And I hate, I hate wasting money. You know, if it ain't broke, don't go and buy a new one. And this isn't broke, it's just I can't get the nut off to replace the blade that's bent. It's got a bent blade. So it chews up the garden. But I can see, I'm gonna, what's a lawnmower these days? 150 quid? For one of the ones that catch, catches all the grass. I want one of the ones that catches the grass. I don't want to rake. So, no, Dave, I've not fixed my lawnmower. Uh, and this is an anonymous text that's very mysterious and a little bit scary. It's about um, cash in hand. When I moved into my village many years ago, the chairman of the parish council took me to one side and thought I should know that this village worked on the black economy. Huh? A whole village working on the black economy? Really? Is that true? I can't believe... I cannot believe that, that the whole village works on... on, on no. Oh, wait, 459, 455, 555. Dan, thank you very much. It, it makes such a difference. I was in the back garden yesterday... Uh, playing with my little boy, and it was wonderful. We had a... There's no hosepipe band, so we had a hose out. The boy was running around in his pants, covering himself with water from the hose. Now, life does not get much better than that. All that reminds me, I was going to talk about this earlier on. We, for some reason, I don't remember why, but I was talking to the production team earlier on, and uh, uh, two of us agreed that one of the, mo- the best things in the world, one of the most comforting things in the world, is a roast dinner cooked by mum. It, it's just the best thing. No one cooks a roast dinner like mum and there is nothing as comforting as going to mum and having her cook a roast dinner now my mum's not very well so she doesn't cook roast dinners anymore but I've, I've kind of learnt I can do the potatoes almost as good as mum so I thought for, we could throw this out as a text 81333CR what are the small things that are really comforting to you the small silly little things that are actually in the, in the great scheme of things are completely inconsequential and meaningless but uh, uh, are comforting to you. You can text 81333. Start your text 3CR. And just let us know. For me, it's, it's got to be roast dinner. Roast potatoes, done by mum, all fluffy, all nice, perfect. Here's a, uh, an interesting quirk. But, uh, I'm sorry for going off on tangents, but th- this is kind of where my head is at today. It's, it's, it's in a very tangent-based uh, place. Uh, I uh, have mint sauce on my roast potatoes. I could have a meal of just mint sauce and roast potatoes. That would that would suit me down to the ground. 
that would, would work perfectly for me. That's all I'd need uh, to keep me satisfied. So small things that keep the, that gets very comforting. 81333, start your text 3CR. You can email as well, of course. Um, 3CR at bbc.co.uk. Uh, there's a thing in the, the... The thing that's amazing about the Olympics, that's in all of the papers, constantly, is this kind of perving over the, um... Uh, the, the, what are they called? The beach volleyball girls. Even the, the, the Daily Mail, which purports to be a vaguely respectable newspaper, has got, you know, page six. An Australian beach volleyball player in London yesterday, warming up, in a slightly, you know, mucky shot. And all of the stories, the, the, the front pages, a lot of the papers, are about Prince Harry, Harry, the millionaire prince, who has got tickets for beach volleyball. Uh, does it strike you as a little bit odd that it's got this kind of pervy outlook on, on the sport? And if I were a beach volleyball player, I'd be well annoyed that the only coverage that I was getting was the fact that I was wearing a bikini. Now, of course, if I was wearing a bikini in public, it would get co- uh, coverage because that's an odd thing for me to be doing, a man who's nearly 40. But it, it just seemed a little bit odd that we're celebrating, you know, the pinnacles of human en- endeavour and achievement. Uh, and basically... We're all perving over the beach volleyball girls. does make me wonder. We're going to come to um, uh, Richard in Bedford very shortly, but uh, David Cameron, Hugh Grant and the parents of Millie Dowler are just a few of the witnesses who've given evidence. But the Leveson inquiry into press standards is expected to hold its last scheduled public hearings today. Victims of media intrusion and representatives from three newspaper groups are due to appear before Lord Justice Leveson before he sets out to write his report due in autumn. We've got media expert Neil Midgley been following the inquiry. I think we can speak to him now. Neil, let's look back at the uh, evidence the inquiry heard. Well, there's been obviously all sorts of evidence from the very serious, the uh, the inquiry opened, you'll recall, with Millie Dowler's parents and and their experience of phone hacking, uh, right through to the very titillating and amusing. So uh, Rebecca Brooks, for example, the former chief executive of Rupert Murdoch's News International, talking about how David Cameron had signed his texts uh, to her LOL, uh, meaning lots of love, uh, until she disabused him of that fantasy and told him it meant laugh out loud instead. So right through from the very serious to the faintly ridiculous. And some of these these revelations were incredibly shocking, weren't they? Well, yes, they were. And in the political sphere, of course, we're still seeing reverberations from uh, the documents that came out, the 160 pages of emails that were disclosed between uh, Rupert Murdoch's people on the one hand and the Department of Culture on the other, and particularly the Culture Secretary, Jeremy Hunt's former, now former, special advisor, Adam Smith, who appeared to be very close to News Corporation when it was trying to take over B Sky B. He, of course, Mr Smith, lost his job over that. Mr Hunt almost lost his job over it. And arguably Mr Hunt's political career will be forever blighted by all of this. So the Leveson Inquiry has had impacts where we didn't necessarily expect it to have. And what's it, finally, what's it hoping to achieve? Is it going to achieve anything? Well... The key to the report when it comes out uh, later in the autumn will be whether Lord Justice Leveson recommends that newspapers should be forced by law into a new system of regulation. Uh, We in the newspaper industry never have before. The current system, the Press Complaints Commission, operates entirely by consent and the newspaper industry has put forward new proposals for a more muscular, independent regulator with a bigger range of sanctions, million-pound fines, potentially. Uh, And the question will be, for newspaper journalists, whether Lord Justice Leveson thinks that that is sufficient or thinks uh, that Parliament should intervene. Neil, thank you very much. Neil Midgley, uh, media expert, talking about the last day of the Leveson inquiry. I want to go to Richard in Bedford. Richard, good morning. Good morning, young man. How are you? Oh, you've called me a young man, so I'm instantly (laughs) feeling much better. What have you called in about, Richard? Uh, Well, two things, actually. Um, Your lawnmower. Oh, God, yeah. Um, well, you pop it around, I'll take the nut off for you, straighten the blade, and you'll have a, a mower that works again. <laughs> Richard, you, you don't know me. I could be a lunatic. You can't well, invite me round. if you come round here and you're a lunatic, I'll, I'll put you down. 
Oh, tough guy. That's a tough guy. I like that. Richard, it's a very kind offer. I, I, I'll see how I get on today, and I'll let you know. Yeah, um, I, if you want me, I'll leave my uh, telephone... Well, they got me telephone number anyway. Good luck. So Thank you, Richard. Can, um, uh, you can ring me by all means. You're very do. kind. The other thing, cash in hand. Yes. Chap don't know what he's talking about. This is uh, David Gork, the MP. Yeah, he don't know. I mean, he's never been in business, so he wouldn't understand, would he? Have you done stuff cash in hand, Richard? I worked for 35 years for myself. Yeah. Right, I'm a cabinet maker. A lot of people in Bedford know me. Yes, you get paid cash. You need cash to buy things for the next job. Yeah. Especially when it comes to local authority and government departments that put 90 days on. So what do you do for 90 days? You have to get other money in. And why should you, when you're owed money, have to pay banks a massive interest to have money on, on an overdraft? But no, Richard, very that's qu- not wrong. Richard, very quickly, does that mean that you're avoiding paying tax? No. Of course it doesn't, because when you put your books in and do it, if people, most people, business okay. people, will, will understand this, you have to put it down. Okay. It's all in there. You're not fiddling anything. All right, Richard, thank you. Well, I think that, that's slightly different from what, what Mr Gork is saying. And thank you for your offer, Richard. It's very kind. Uh, because I think he's specifically targeting those people who take the cash in hand but then don't declare it and don't pay the tax, which is, which is, you know, of course, very naughty. On FM, AM and online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, this is Ian Lee. Don't forget, you can, t- you can take part in the show any time you want. If there's anything we're talking about that kind of affects you or you want to have your say on... Or maybe there's something we're not talking about that you think we should. Then you can give me a call, 08459. 455 555 08459 455 555. Here's something you might have uh, an opinion on. It's just over a month since Bedford Borough Council launched their controversial new water turbine, the Archimedes Screw. But it's already been temporarily switched off for calibration. Bedford Borough Council claim that even though it cost around half a million pounds to install, it will generate about £32,000 worth of electricity every year. But not everyone is convinced that they'll make that money. The Conservatives on the council claim that the screw has been installed in the wrong place, and that's, uh, this is why it's having to be turned off periodically. Caroline Fenton is from Bedford Borough Council. Good morning, Caroline. Oh, good morning. You've been opposed to this money, uh, this operation from the start, haven't you? Absolutely, yes. Why is that? Uh, it's a waste of money, and there are a lot more important things than money should have been spent on. Um, and we just don't have a suitable river for this sort of technology. What kind of things would you have spent the money on, briefly, that, that, that you consider to be more important? Uh, well, in my ward, there's 20 children that can't go to their local school because there's not room in the school. Uh, this money would have spent would have been better spent on a couple of new classrooms. In the great scheme of things, half a million pounds isn't that much, particularly when it's uh, t- said that it's going to make the money back within a f- uh, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, I don't think they've done their sums very well. Really? Um, if you consider this money is borrowed, um, nobody talks about the interest repayments on it. Um, it, it, it they, they say it will pay back the capital in 16 years if it's working at absolutely optimum efficiency. It certainly won't pay back the interest. Um, we all know about compound interest. So you're saying that, um, that it will actually have to pay back more than uh, half a million pounds, and also the fact that it's, it's been turned off already uh, means that it's not going to make as much money per year as perhaps we've been led to believe? No, it won't make as much money. Um, they've already downgraded the uh, proposed amount. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I don't think the council were aware that the water authority are able to turn the water down. If there's uh, any uh, flood risk, they close the sluices. Well, Caroline, so we've got Dave Hodgson, who's the mayor of Bedford Online. Good morning, David. Good morning, Ian. Uh, is the screw operating at the moment? Um, I think it is today, yes, but I'm, okay. not, I'm not sure. I mean, it's obviously been calibrated. If you do the sums, we've actually uh, generated 13.9 megawatts. You have to times that by 12, um, oh. and you get and you get how much we're going to generate a year. And I, I estimate we're bang on target um, for the 160 megawatts we were t- intending. Now, and of ca- course da- the, David, sorry. so let me talk. Caroline yeah. raised a couple of issues there, yeah. that it's not going to be half a million pounds you have to pay back. It's going to be half a million pounds plus interest. Is that true? Um, we obviously have to pay the interest back, yes, of course. How much is that interest going to be? 
I couldn't tell you off, off hand, Ian. You've got I no mean, idea? No, I mean, it's actually, it, it would be at the public sector uh, borrowing rate, so it's lower than most people pay for interest, so public sector uh, borrowing board. Um, but if you look at how much we got, I mean, we would, I think we generate more electricity. Uh, Councillor Fenson's uh, view that we, the Environment Agency can turn it off, she's quite right, but we always knew that, and it was always actually estimated to do that. And also the figures are based on what the price of electricity was when we started the process, and it's already gone up once, and in the 25 years, I'd love to think that electricity won't go up in price, but my bet, my money's on the fact it will, unfortunately. So, David, are you still saying, even with the interest factors in now, uh, that it, within 15 years, and with these um, occasional switchings off, that the screw will have um, paid for itself? Yes, I believe so, and let's, let's give it a year to see how it goes, and we can come back and talk in a year's time, see how much electricity and how much money we've generated. Um, I think when it's been calibrated, uh, the naysayers that say this is a stupid idea. Remember, we had 19 weirs, 19 working um, um, uh, corn grinders in the Great Ooze in Bedford Borough in years gone by. It's a very traditional thing to do. We're using a modern take on it, albeit that Archimedes screws are 2,000 years old. Caroline, Dave seems, seems to think that it, it will make the money back and that this is a sensible thing to be doing. Well, I don't think so, and... The whole premise is based on feed-in tariffs, and we know with solar power that they've been cut in half recently. If this was cut in half, um, well, it would be less than 16,000, and if you're paying interest, every 1% of interest you're paying is, you know, is, is 5,600. So, you know, <laughs> even if they're lucky enough to be only paying 2%, that um, that makes a huge hole in in whatever they're saving. David, did you forget the interest? Was that was that left out no, of the I'm sums? Just, I'm just looking at my papers. Actually, the money's not borrowed. We're actually doing it from our own reserves. Uh, though we have money, so it's from our thing. We haven't borrowed it from a bank or anybody. So there's no interest to pay at all. So David, accounts defence and wrong. Well, that, so that's that's something. But David, did you not know that already? Well, I've got it in front of me. I, I can't keep everything, but I've had the papers in front of me while you're talking. But David, you would think you would know where you got half a million pounds from. Yes, well, I've just told you where we got it from. I'm just surprised that you weren't that wasn't a fact that you knew. Okay, you can be surprised, but I, you know, as I said, okay, it's, I not, it's not borrowed. Yep. Car- Caroline, that, well, that solves that problem then, doesn't it? If, if the money's not borrowed, if it's their money, then there's no interest. Well... So that's the argument out of the, shot out of the water, isn't it? Not really. If there's half a million pounds lying about, you know, in the capital but it, budget... But it, it stops the argument about the interest. Another, why borrow another 15 million? Well, as, as Councillor Fenton knows, we've stopped actually external borrowing from the council. It's one of the things we actually went to, and she voted on in the council, and there's no more external borrowing. The other interesting thing, Ian, if you just may say so, that when this went through uh, before Councillor Fenton was a council, Councillor Fenton was a councillor. Everybody voted for it across all parties. This had been an idea that uh, the late Frank Branson had uh, ten years ago as an idea to, uh, to bring this to fruition. When we brought it to council uh, a couple of years ago, everybody on the council, all parties voted for this. Caroline, another criticism that you have, uh, if I've got this correct, is that it's not located in the right place. The water isn't deep enough. Is that right? That's right, yes. And the, the models that Frank Branston saw were in Germany, in big, fast-flowing rivers. David, what's, how do you counter that? Uh, there's a drop in the height of the rivers from the upper river to the lower river. We're using the natural fall in the river to generate electricity, uh, and it's working, and it's generating electricity. Is it true that you have to switch it off at certain points to allow um, canoeists to have enough water? Yeah, I mean, that, that's always in the agreement that uh, uh, we'll actually be turned off when we've got low uh, uh, water levels, or in fact high water levels, and also when we open duck mills, sluice gates, so the, uh, the kayakers can actually have the white water. But that was all factored in at the very beginning, um, and we actually understand that, and it actually helps the kayakers as well, because we can actually use the water there, the, uh, the sluice gate, duck mill sluice. How often does, does it have to be uh, turned off for, and, and how long? Oh, that's an agreement with the uh, the kayakers, and I think it's uh, I think it's up to a hundred times a year from recollection uh, for about ninety minutes to two to two hours. But that's negotiating with the kayaking club. Okay. They're they're growing. I mean, Viking Kayak Club is a very very successful club. They've got lots of kayakers, and they've also got one of their members actually in the uh, Olympics. And we wish Etienne 
all the best breeding pigs and hopefully he gets uh, better than the bronze he got last time. Caroline, are you making a fuss about nothing, really? Because isn't this, in the, you know, we're running out of natural resources. We have to try and find as many alternative ways to generate electricity. Uh, and it's going to, uh, th- there's going to be investment, isn't there? This, this does, surely this sounds like a sensible plan, doesn't it? Uh, if the same money had been invested in solar power, it, it would be actually make an, an impression. It would have created a lot of electricity. This this project is. Um, well, you say you, joke, you, really. you say you say a lot, Caroline. Uh, how much in comparison with the Archimedes screw? Do you know? I don't know offhand, but um, if if the same amount had been invested in solar power, say to you know, cover the whole of the top of Borough Hall. You could have run Borough Hall for this amount. We already have uh, uh, solar panels on the top of Borough Hall. Uh, we've also invested the, from the Climate Change Fund in a number of solar panels in all kinds of community buildings, in schools, and uh, ward members have actually put some of their money. And if Councillor Fenson wanted to do, she could have invested some of her ward money in, in solar panels for her schools in her area. She chose not to do that. Uh, David, finally, Caroline Fenson says that the Archimedes screw is a joke. She's wrong. Thank you very much. That's uh, Dave Hodgson, who's the Mayor of Bedford, and Caroline Fenson from the Bedford Borough Council. Thank you very much. Fascinating. What do you think? 08459 455 555. Half a million pounds. Uh, Well invested? We have to look for alternate methods of, of generating energy, don't we? Of course we do. Oil and electricity is so expensive. That this makes sense. I am a little surprised the mayor didn't know where that half a million pounds came from. You would have thought he would have been on top. That's a lot of money. But it makes sense, doesn't it, that we need to find ways to generate energy and power. And we have to look at alternative methods. Or maybe you think it's a waste of money. 08459 455 555. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 7.46, Tuesday the 24th of July. These are the headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Commuters in the three counties are being told to prepare travel plans ahead of the Olympics, which start on Friday. Train company First Capital Connect are predicting delays despite over 760,000 extra seats. And the Hearts County showground at Redbourne will be a park and ride base for game spectators. A Hertfordshire MP and Conservative Treasury Minister has accused householders who pay tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong. South West Hearts MP David Gork says such arrangements are helping people to avoid paying tax. In sport, in last night's football friendlies, Luton won 2-0 at St Albans and Milton Keynes Dons won 2-0 in Ireland against St James's Gate. The weather for beds, hearts and bucks dry with long spells of unbroken sunshine and feeling hot once again. The day's maximum temperature, 29 degrees Celsius. Coming up, more in the pricing of the white stuff. No, not that milk I'm talking about. An agreement was finally reached yesterday in the dispute over how much money farmers receive to make it. We'll bring you more in the next few moments. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. To give her Dave Hodgson, the Mayor of Bedford, and Caroline Fenson, uh, an opposition uh, councillor there. What do you think about the Archimedes screw? Waste of money? Or a sensible option in these days... Uh, when energy and electricity are becoming rarer and more expensive. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. You can give me a call uh, and let me know. We've got uh, a couple of emails and texts about working cash in hand. Um, You can email uh, 3cr at bbc.co.uk. I very nearly gave gave you my own private email address there. That would be awful. I did once give up my phone number on it by mistake. Years and years ago, I gave up my phone number uh, instead of the, the station phone number. Luckily, it was on a station that no one listened to in the middle of the night and no one heard it. Uh, An email from Anonymous. You're all anonymous. Look at that. Those traders that take cash in hand still have to buy the materials for those jobs. If you buy, if they buy them from their usual supply, it goes on an account, especially if they are a VAT paying company. They will buy on account. Therefore, cash may well be logged in their taxable accounts. Well, I think that's the thing. David Gork, I don't think, and we'll find out maybe a bit later on. He's not criticising people who are um, uh, who are taking cash in hand and paying tax on that. 
That's legitimate. If you get a receipt, you pay by cash, uh, and they declare it. That's fine. I think he's he's uh, angry with those people who are getting cash in hand and not declaring it, and therefore not paying tax. Uh, Matt says, if the government is worried about tax dodging through cash in hand, they should look to themselves first. How many MPs, bankers, and the likes dodge tax through legitimate offshore accounts and clever accountants? Thank you, Matt. Now, this milk story, which we, uh, we, we touched upon yesterday and uh, has been in the news. Do you care about the price of your milk? Well, I guess you do. After days of protests, an agreement was finally reached yesterday in the dispute over the price paid to Britain's farmers for the milk they produce. It'll give dairy farmers greater bargaining power and more notice of a change in the amount the processors are willing to pay. The farming, ministers, uh, farming minister, sorry, Jim Pace, says it isn't his job to set the price of milk, but he's ready to intervene if the code doesn't work. I've made it absolutely clear it is in today's agreement that if this code does not work, then government, British government, uh, Welsh government, Scottish government, reserve the right to legislate according to the dairy package. But I really believe that is a second best option because we could not legislate to set the price or even set the mechanism by which price is created. So this code has the potential of doing much more than legislation could ever do. The supermarket Aldi is the latest to confirm it will increase the price it pays for milk. The government has confirmed it will meet representatives of major retailers on Wednesday in a further attempt to end the dispute. The agreement is only a draft agreement and more work will continue on the deal over the summer. The Conservative MP, Anne McIntosh, who's the chairman of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee, says there are a number of issues that need to be resolved in the longer term. I think we need to strengthen the supply chain. I, I think the farmer at the moment is very much bottom of the pile uh, and I think we, anything we can do we, we called f- as part of the EU uh, dairy package last year in July 2011 we called for the contract to stipulate price the length of the contract the volume and deliveries and I, I think those are the basic things that I would personally like to see in such an agreement. The National Farmers Union say the deal has given them some hope but says its protests will continue. Stephen James, James is from the NFU in Wales. Seven billion of lit- litres of milk is consumed in, uh, in the UK in a, in a 12 month and, and therefore you know, the consumer wants to drink milk so you know, if farmers aren't able or can't afford to stay in the industry then that's going to disappear and so it's vital that it does work and that's important for us as dairy farmers for the processor and for the consumer it did seem incredible yesterday when we had the farmer and the dairy farmer on saying that they lost money on every pint of milk they made they they were losing money they were paying the farmers were paying to make the milk Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Uh, we're talking about cash in hand. After David Gork MP says that you are morally wrong and morally repugnant if you do it. Let's go to uh, Ron in Luton. Good morning, Ron. Hello. Very interesting morning. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it, sir. So, what's your take on this cash in hand story? My question is this: the window cleaner turns up to have the windows cleaned. He's an ordinary guy, but he runs a business. Hmm. How? What instrument do I? use to pay him uh, well uh, you, there are several you could use cash well is there any other way if an ordinary man we, we all live in this sort of world where the, y- a man very rarely pays the window cleaner it's usually the wife gets the money she pays the window cleaner what he does with it if he's running his business he needs the cash because there's no other way of paying him. Check. So my question is, what instrument has the government stated we use to pay the window cleaner? How about check? I've paid a window cleaner with a check before. Well, sir, quite honestly, I just, there just aren't those many checks around these days. I haven't got a checkbook anymore. Have you not got a checkbook, Ron? I have a business <laughs> checkbook, but I haven't got an ordinary checkbook. I have a checkbook, and there was a... Because they were going to get rid of checks, weren't they? But I read um, uh, either late last week or early this week that the check has been saved, that well, checks are going to stay around. Then may I ask this question? Please do. Why don't you run a little morning questionnaire okay. that says, how many people today use a checkbook? That's an excellent question. I'm going to put that out there, Ron. How and many I would people? Love to offer, I'd love to offer my window cleaner or the, the guy who comes and cuts the grass a cheque. 
I think he'd look at me and say, thank you very much, goodbye. <laughs> well, this is the problem, isn't it? That, that there are these, these sort of smaller services, like window cleaners, uh, like people who come and cut your grass for a few quid, that if you suddenly start asking for invoices and they start having to declare, d- declare it and paying tax on it, they're, go- they're not going to be making enough money for them to bother doing it. But- well, a window cleaner takes about £12,000 a year c- c- cleaning, gl- gl- cleaning the house windows. Um, he has got to declare that. He has no choice if he's running a business. But I mean, if you're paying, if you're paying cash, Ron, he doesn't. He, he, he morally and legally he has to declare it, but he he won't necessarily do that. But is that the is that the responsibility of the householder? No, it's by law. It's the responsibility of the business. Precisely. So he he the government should I- introduce an instrument that allows all householders to pay the window cleaner or the gardener. Uh, make it illegal to pay cash. So give me an instrument, please. Accept a check. Forget the check. <laughs> you can't, Ron. You can't forget the check. The well, check I can. is the, the check is there. I haven't got a check. <laughs> Phone up your bank today. I like you. You're good. Phone up your bank today, Ron, and get a checkbook. At eighty-one years of age, so I don't need the checkbook. It's an eighty-one years of age. You don't need to be call me, calling me, sir. Th- Ron, thank you very much for that. He's asked a very good question, and we will put this out there. How many of you listening have a checkbook? I suspect it's quite high, isn't it? I've got a checkbook. I don't use it very often, but I've got, I, I always have to hunt for it when I need it. Never quite remember where I've left it. But it, it's there. It's around. I write checks. I send checks. 08459 four double five five double five. Ron there saying that for smaller things, what are you going to do? Of course you're going to pay cash. And it should be up to the business. Well, it is up to the business to declare it. But are they declaring it? 08459 four double five five double five is the uh, the telephone number if you want to give me a hand on that. We've got Karen in Potter's Karen Bar. In Potter's Bar. Uh, Karen, could you turn uh, your, your radio off for a second, please? There we go. That's better. Yeah, it is, yeah. That's better. Yeah. Karen, what, what, what's your take on this? Well, basically, I'm registered employed. Um, I get cash. So cash you're, 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 what was that? Your phone dropped out. You're registered? Okay. I'm registered self-employed. Okay, um, yep. I'm a fitness instructor. And the thing is, obviously, um, with that, um, what happens is, oh, God almighty. Right. You're, you're, are you all right? What's going on? Yeah, so I, so I just had to put it over. Uh, I hope I, I hope you're... No, no, I had you on loud, and obviously you couldn't hear me because it go. echoes, so I put Thank it on. Thank you I'll very much. Over. Okay. Right, OK. Um, what it is, um, if you're registered self-employed... It, you you have to put everything, you put things for your books yeah. because the thing is it's not worth it if you don't because you can't claim that you know the expenses and things like that would go towards it. For example, you're going to pay petrol to if you're like a window cleaner to get there and back, yeah. and then you you know you want to put in for that, don't you? Yeah, but if you're a window cleaner, I'm not having a good window cleaners. It's just that's what's come up. Uh, if you're a window cleaner and you're doing all your jobs uh, cash in hand, you could declare two of them and not declare the other. So you declare half of them. And you don't declare the other half. So you can still claim for your petrol and your expenses, and your income looks a little bit less than it actually is, and the rest just goes into your pocket. That's one way around it, isn't it? No. So, yeah. So I'm not, not encouraging anyone to do this. I'm just saying that that's a possibility. So you, I'm, I'm assuming as a, as a fitness instructor, you never do cash in hand. Everything is legitimate, is goes through the books, and it is above board. Yeah, I do think I, I, I do things through the books. I get cash, obviously, because people pay me cash. But I have other ways they pay me as well. Does it annoy it you, Karen? Very quickly, because we're running out of time. Does it annoy you these small companies that take the cash in hand and don't declare it? Well, yeah, because obviously we'll all tot up. But the thing is, I, I just want to make another point. Very quickly. Um, is that, that's been going on for a long time, as we know anyway, you know, obviously, visibly. So why they bring it up now does make me laugh. I think it just makes me wonder if maybe they should think about is it expenses, claiming extortion expenses morally wrong. Uh, Karen, thank you very much indeed. As Karen, they're saying maybe the MP should be looking at what's going on in their own pockets uh, rather than having a go at small independent businesses. Karen, thank you very much. 08459 four double five five double five. Seven 7 o'clock coming up next hour. More... About working cash in hand. Is it morally wrong to do that? David Gork seems to think it is. 08459 four double five five double five. Time for the news and sport now. It's Simon Oxley. 
you very much, Simon. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, here for the next couple of weeks uh, until nine o'clock today. So many texts on uh, playing cash in hand uh, and the Olympics. Uh, th- th- here's something I threw out earlier on, and I, I will touch on this very briefly now. We are asking for the little pleasures in life, the small things that are seemingly insignificant, but just make you happy. This is because I was talking to the production team, and, and we, we two of us agreed. Mum's roast dinners. It, it, there is no meal. For, you can go to one of the best restaurants in the world. Nothing will taste as nice as mum's roast dinners. Uh, a couple of texts. Judy says, The small comforting thing for me is snuggling into bed in flannelette sheets when the winter arrives. Anonymous says, The cold side of the pillow. Oh, yeah, I tell you what I like. When the sheets have been changed. At the end of the month, when you've got new sheets in, I'm joking, we do it every week. We do it every week, but it's nice. And Adam says, little pleasures, when you get a little wink and a discount for paying cash. Adam, no, 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 no. By the way, we're not condoning paying for cash and avoiding tax in the slightest. I have to say that. But we are asking, do you do it? Is it, is it morally wrong to do it? We've got loads of texts on that, and we will talk about that more. 08459... Four double five five double five. But first, more than 30 miles of road lanes dedicated to the Olympic traffic comes into force in London from tomorrow. The Olympic lanes will limit uh, traffic in some cases to just athletes and officials travelling to the events to ensure they arrive on time for games. It's going to be interesting to see if you're stuck in traffic like on the North Circular or on the M4 or something like that, and loads of those, those BMWs with Olympic officials in goes past, what kind of reaction are they going to get? I would have thought it's not going to be a very good one. Earlier on in this show, we heard from one Bedfordshire-based courier company who claimed lives could be put at risk as a result of these restrictions. Barbara Moss is the financial director of Letchworth Couriers Limited, who deliver blood samples and medical supplies. She told us that when they provide such an important service, they should be included within the emergency services bracket. There have, in the past, quite frequently been people literally on the operating table when a part has been called for. We have, in the past, had drivers, you know, they've been... in constant contact with us all the way through from pick-up in Letchworth all the way into the centre of London and where the driver's been, you know, waiting and he's in a queue, he literally just pulled over on the side of the road, got out of the car and ran with it into the hospital, up in, up to the operating theatre and delivered the goods. And one particular occasion when that occurred, we had a call back later saying, thank you very much, Can you let your driver know you helped save a life today. It's an important job that they do. And joining us now is Transport for London's Director of Planning, Ben Plowden. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Ben, you just heard Barbara then. What's your reaction to that story? Well, clearly, uh, there's no doubt at all that the Olympics uh, and, the, and the Olympic route network you mentioned are going to have a significant effect on the city. Uh, and it's been a requirement since the Atlantic Games in 1996 to have such a network. So, as you said, we can get everyone to the Games on time. We've been working very very closely with, with the NHS, with, with courier companies like the one you've just heard from, to make sure that they can, they fully understand where the Olympic Road Network is, when it will be operating, what the rules are for the Games lanes, to, to avoid the sorts of situations that, that, that the person who you just interviewed spoke about. So it's, it, it, if people need to know more about how this is going to operate and how they can avoid getting stuck, uh, the best thing is to go to our website, getaheadofthegames.com, where all the details about how this is going to operate and the hours of operation will be in place and they can see how to make the journey they've got to make uh, as quickly as they can. But um, Barbara was just saying there that the, her, her company, they, they save lives. Yeah, no, I mean, of course, and, and we've been working with all sorts of people, with the brewery industry, with the cash and transit people who collect money to and from banks, with, with, um, with undertakers right across uh, all the sectors in the economy who are going to have to take account of the Olympics uh, as part of their planning for the Games. And, of course, some of the, the, blue, the, the main blue light vehicles will be able to go in the Games zones when they're on a blue light call, and, and, and we just need to make sure that everybody else understands the operation so they can make their journeys planned appropriately. And as I say, the best thing to do is to go to the website and just check out the details to make sure they know exactly how the routes are going to operate and they can get the journeys done as, as, as safely as they can. So, listen, so Ben, uh, ambulances and fire engines and police cars, if uh, they're on a blue light call, they're allowed to use the Olympic lanes, no problems? They are, that's right. Okay. Uh, we've got a, a lot of listeners who will be commuting in. Can you explain how the Olympic lanes work? What, right. What the hours are and when they come into operation? Right, so there's two very important things to say. The first is that the Olympic route network is, is about, as you said, about 30 miles, about 1% of the roads in London. Now, all traffic can use the Olympic route network, bar 
cars, buses, vans, motorbikes. They're, they're, it's open to general traffic. The, the one thing I would say is that some of the side turnings onto and off the Olympic route network will be closed in order to keep the traffic flowing smoothly. For a very small part, about a third of the Olympic route network, then there are the games lanes in which only the uh, official vehicles, the Olympic vehicles, can travel. And that will mainly be actually buses and coaches carrying you know, 15, 20 athletes and, spe- and officials on the way to and from the park. Um, so the, the games lanes are restricted only to Olympic traffic, um, and people who, who use the games lanes will potentially be subject to a fine if they're clearly using it as a way of, of getting along the road quicker. But the thing to say, the one thing, the thing to say, the, the yes. Olympic route network will actually be flowing pretty smoothly precisely because it's designed to make these journeys predictable and reliable from, say, a hotel in central London or a training site somewhere else in, in South London to the Olympic venues quickly and efficiently. Ben, you say the Olympic lanes will mainly be coaches and things like that, but what, what's this a fleet of, is it 300 BMWs? If people see those going past and they're stuck in traffic, they're going to be quite resentful, aren't they? Well, there are, I mean, I think people hopefully will, will, will take account of the fact that, that this is a requirement of, of, of the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. Um, there will be some individual vehicles, the cars you mentioned, travelling up and down the game zones, but the vast majority of, of both athletes and, and officials and the media, which is the other group who can use Olympic lanes, will be in buses and coaches. So people aren't going to mm-hmm. see uh, sort of single cars, hundreds of single cars. What they are going to see is loads and loads of buses and coaches um, reasonably full with people travelling at reasonably high speed and predictably along the lanes to, to the venue so people can get to there. So Usain Bolt, for example, doesn't turn up 15 seconds late for the 100 metres final, which wouldn't be a great outcome for London. He could probably still win it if he turned up late. <laughs> ben, could. you said there that the media get to use it. Can I go in the Olympic lanes, please? If you're not an accredited oh, journalist, unfortunately nuts. you can't. You could try, but you might, you might, you might get a ticket. What is, uh, what is the fine if people do drive in? It's £130, and what we're hoping cool. is that we'll actually have uh, issue as few tickets as possible because people will obviously will, will uh, understand the rules and, and stick with them. So we're hoping that we won't need to, to levy many fines because uh, the lanes are clearly marked. And the other crucial thing to say is that the Olympic, the Olympic lanes will not be used unless they are necessary in terms of the number of people needing to get to and from the park. Right. So when they're not needed, there'll be what are called variable message signs on the side of the road saying either lanes in operation or lanes not in operation, at which case anybody on the Olympic route network can use the game lanes as well. Who gets the money from the fines? Uh... I'm not exactly sure of that question. I think uh, I think the central government does, but I, I ought to check and get back to you. I don't actually know. OK. And can, uh, you, may, you probably don't know this. Uh, do you know if any fines have been issued already? No, because the lanes don't operate until tomorrow, as you said, in the, in the introduction. But the, the, the M4 one has. Uh, has that's been true. That's operated by the highways agency. That okay. has come into operation. That's, preci- that's because um, at the start this week, obviously, the, the Olympic family starts arriving from Heathrow into central London, and then obviously from tomorrow they'll be starting to use the, the network to get to and from the main park of Stratford. Ben, you're excellent with all the lingo the olympic family oh yes well, well that, done. what that means what that means is, is the athletes respect the uh, officials and the, and the accredited media just but I, I know you can't because you're in an official position but doesn't part of you feel like just saying oh come on guys it's only for a few weeks lighten up it's the olympics well what's interesting is that when we we've been uh, trying to obviously communicating all these factors as hard as we can over the last six to 12 months and I think what's happened is that as the, as the opening ceremony is drawn cl- closer and closer now we've obviously got the rehearsals going on this week we had the Tour de France which really I think brought everything to, brought everything to life mm. people have started realising quite how significant this is as a sporting event and as an effect on the city I mean obviously a hugely positive event and I think people now can go to our, to our website they can look at our Twitter feeds and they can get all the information they need to make sure that the, the games have as little impact as possible whilst we watch the sports uh, the finest sports in the world Very Quickly, Ben, what's the website people need to go to to find out w- what roads are affected? Getaheadofthegames.com. Everything you need is there. And can we speak to you after the Olympics and, and you know, see if, if this was a success Absolutely. or a disaster? I'd, I'd be delighted to come on, yeah. Ben, thank you very much. There we go. It's Ben Plowden, who is uh, the Transport for London's Director of Planning. He was good with all the Olymp- uh, Olympic family. It's good, wasn't he? Uh, I, I, do, you, do you know what? If I'd have spoken to him three weeks ago, I'd have been kind of, come on, Ben, sort this out, this isn't fair. But I'm really getting excited by it. I'm genuinely getting excited by it. Are you... We've got some texts, actually, on this. Um, uh, Dave the Thatch says, I'm fed up of the Olympics. I didn't want it and will not watch any of it. Why should people change their way to travel and make money for this broke country just for this so-called sport event? Uh, and Nick in Hitchin says, I drive for a major retailer and none, repeat, none of my colleagues have any interest in the games whatsoever. Not a jot of interest in any of them. Wow. He's dead against it. It's interesting. I'll be I'm really keen to know. And we, we will try and speak to Ben. I may not be here, but whoever's here, I think, should try and speak to Ben uh, after the Olympics uh, and find out how many fines were issued and how much money was raised and where that money goes to. £130 a fine 
is a lot of money, isn't it? That's a big fine. Is it half if you pay it early? I don't know. Should have asked. Uh, and, oh, here's the question that's been, been bugging everyone all morning. What's a trillion? Uh, John from Harpenden says, a trillion is a thousand billion, which is the same as a million million. Oh, I see. He says, we've got so used to using the word billions that now we're trying to find a way of something even bigger, so we're using trillion. Either way, it's a lot of money. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Commuters in the three counties being told to prepare travel plans ahead of the Olympics, which start on Friday. Train company First Capital Connect are predicting delays despite over 760,000 extra seats. And on the roads, the Hearts Co- uh, County showground at Redbourne will be a park and ride base for game spectators. A Hertfordshire MP and Conservative Treasury Minister has accused householders who pay tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong. South West Hearts MP David Gork says such arrangements are helping people to avoid paying tax. In sport, in last night's football friendlies, Luton won 2-0 at St Albans and Milton Keynes Dons won 2-0 in Ireland against St James's Gate. We'll have a full sports bulletin with Simon in 15 minutes. Also have a weather bulletin in a few moments with Dan Holly. And coming up, the inquiry, which has been examining press standards, is expected to finish today. Next, we'll speak to a man from St Albans, who's a former deputy editor of the News of the World and the Daily Mirror. Good morning, dear listener. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties. And normally, um, I would have the fragrant smell of Jonathan Vernon Smith, who is, if you've never met him, he's a beautiful smelling man. He's not here this morning. Uh, Justin Deeney's here. I instead. am. I who am stinks? <laughs> Absolutely stinks. Oh, how are you then, Marlon? You well? <laughs> you smell wonderful, oh, thank sir. You. Thank you. You're looking very, uh, very summary as well you've got the short uh, sleeves on yeah, you're all set yeah. to go Look broke back mountain here we come with the t-shirt it's very nice isn't the, it with the t-shirt good yeah, yeah. Uh, what's on the show you're filling in for Jonathan today what's on the show today Justin? we're going to be talking about something that you've been talking about today is paying cash in hand morally wrong mm. the treasury minister and Harpershire MP David Gork has accused householders who pay tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong yeah when was the last time you paid for something cash in hand because I can't remember um, I have done it. I haven't done it for a while. We had a plumber yesterday. That was legitimate and above board. And I'm glad it was, because he ain't fixed the problem. <laughs> right. Um, uh, a, a few years ago. The thing is, once you start doing a job like this, you have to be very careful, because if you get caught out, then you're in big trouble. So, uh, a while ago. Well, it's thought the government loses about £2 billion a year through tradesmen who don't declare their earnings. So, uh, a few things this morning. Do you still pay cash in hand for anything? If so, what do you pay cash in hand for? But I want to try and get to grips with this argument that tradesmen are coming up with today. They are saying that we take cash in hand because we need access to funds for the next job. Heard that a few times. Yep. Is that true, or is that just an excuse to actually avoid paying tax? We've had a lot of uh, people, in fact we've got a text um, uh, on it saying that there's an, like a 90 day invoicing system, mm. so they have to kind of get their, pay their money up front. And I don't think there's a problem with that, is there? With, if, if you're being paid cash, as long as you're declaring it and putting it through the books, I don't think uh, Mr Gork has a problem. It's that thing of taking cash and then putting it in your back pocket. Mm, maybe declaring two out of the five jobs. I'm plucking that figure from thin air this morning, but is paying cash in hand morally wrong? Is, that, is course, that how you work at the BBC? <laughs> you, you, you declare <laughs> two of the days. Yes. And actually, I think we've got a statistics course coming up here at the BBC very soon, so I'll make sure I'm on that. <laughs> Justin, I should be listening to that. Are you doing the consumer hour as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, man, getting stuck it. in. Have you got to do the phone calls after the show? Because when I phoned yeah. in for Jonathan, I had to phone up the companies. I didn't realise. I thought it was all, you know, the team would do it. But see, I love all that. I love, I love it, because you phone up with a complaint you say hi i'm ringing about a complaint oh yeah okay yes i'm from the bbc oh yes how can i help you it, sir? isn't it amazing <laughs> when you put those three letters in yeah. a conversation suddenly things get sorted out a lot of looking them. forward to justin it. i look forward to listening to you justin uh, Dealey in for um jonathan vernon smith jonathan's back tomorrow but it, it's it's well worth listening to i'm a, a big fan of both of these gentlemen and i'll be honest they both smell wonderful they both smell absolutely delightful Uh, We have got some texts about cash in hands. Some of the large uh, companies I carry out work for make us wait 90 days for invoices. Oh, this is the one I was referencing just then. And I have to pay their accounts department for that service as well. Cash jobs keep me going a lot of the time. The government does nothing to help me on the late payment issue. I have to pay my vet bill every month regardless of whether I've been paid, says Rob. Oh, vet bill. (laughs) I was thinking, what? What's the vet bill got to do with it? That's come from nowhere. Sorry, Rob, I do apologise. I, I am uh, officially an idiot. Uh, Nick in Hitchin says, Before our MPs start lecturing us on cash in hand, they ought to examine their own expenses, like flat screen tellies, having moats cleaned, hiring adult films, or using taxis to go miles. Hypocrisy or what? Well, they have looked at that thing, haven't they? 
And that's pretty much been sorted out. Uh, Lee from uh, Sandy says the same thing as regards to cash in hand being morally wrong. Is it not wrong also for an MP to claim cash that they have also dwindled, I think you mean diddled, out of the system? What's good for them is also good for me. And Anonymous says, cash in hand, agree with David Gork. I've got well-off friends who withdrew maximum cash every day for two weeks from a cash machine to avoid VAT on a makeover job, so they connive with the builder to avoid paying. It's unfair on the rest of us who have to pay up. Anonymous. Well, is it unfair? Because if everyone did pay this extra VAT and this extra tax, tax wouldn't go down. VAT wouldn't go down. We wouldn't be saving money. We wouldn't get a reduction in it. We wouldn't get anything, would we? Oh eight four five nine four double five, five double five is the phone number. Beds, hearts, and bucks. Weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Let's get the weather with Dan Holly. Dan, thanks, Dan. Call oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. BBC Three Counties Radio. The Leveson inquiry is expected to draw to a close after holding its last scheduled public hearings today. The inquiry, which has been examining press standards, including the hacking of voicemails and illegal payments by newspapers, led famously to the closure of the News of the World last year. Well, Paul Conyu comes uh, from St Albans, and he's a former deputy editor of the News of the World and the Daily Mirror. He's also a media consultant. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Uh, what do you think the Leveson inquiry has achieved? Um, very, very interesting question. That perhaps it's achieved perhaps more than some people expected, and less than others expected. In, a, in effect, it's probably told us more about politicians and police officers than it has about the press. Certainly, in terms of what surprised uh, the public. Um, the issue, I think, though, is going to be what Lord Lewison recommends, um, which his report isn't due, until, isn't due until the autumn. Um, it's going to be a tricky one for him, because I think he's very conscious that uh, you know, his report could end up, as some similar ones have done in the past, into the media, rather kicked into the long grass. Um, uh, as we saw it on the inquiry, David Cameron, who actually ordered the inquiry, actually was a bit evasive about uh, his view of uh, any statutory uh, underpinning uh, of the press. Um, Sir Michael Gove famously upset Lord Leveson by, uh, you know, by very much sort of, you know, opposing the inquiry itself in some ways and, and describing it as uh, having a chilling effect on uh, on on press freedom. Uh, Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg, etc., I think were, you know, were certainly more sympathetic towards the idea of statutory under, underpinning, which certainly seems to be what Leveson has in mind. Mm. But 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 uh, but Leveson has to have. A of concern, I think, that, uh, that political opinion is going to be very divided on this one, and, um, you know, how much of his recommendations actually turn into uh, into anything is, 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 is the big question. Well, I have to pick you up on something. You said there that the, 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 the uh, pol- uh, police and politicians probably came out of it worse. I think everybody came out of it pretty badly, the, the press included. There were some pretty horrible revelations were made about everybody oh, listen i'm not i'm not in any way defending the sort of uh, industrial scale electronic fishing expeditions that were done by the news of the world or indeed what happened to the dowler Dow family the mccanns etc not for a moment but what i'm but what i'm saying is given this inquiry was ordered uh, uh, into the media i think in a sense um off the back of the of public outrage of Emily Dowler, and, and I think in panic to an extent by David Cameron because of the growing embarrassment over his appointment of Andy Coulson to the heart of government, that that in fact that, that the public were expecting the, the, the press to emerge, you know, um, with quite a lot of. Uh, of, um, manure over itself, yes. in fact, well but, but I think, but I think they were more surprised by the revelations about uh, about politicians and police, that, you know, um, than they were about the press. If you like, they were really geared up for that. But Paul, the revelations about others were more surprising. Paul, do you think the media will learn any lessons from this? I think they already have. Um, I think if you, uh, you know, I, I think press behaviour is, uh, certainly I, I, I'd be very surprised if anybody is still fa- hacking phones or, uh, or hacking, or hacking emails. Um, 
At the same time, we have to remember that things like the MP's expenses scandal and indeed the scale of the phone hacking and the cover-up that surrounded it were only exposed by other newspapers. So I think we've got to be very careful that what we don't get out of Leveson is something that actually limits... Mm genuine mm. public interest investigative journalism. Uh, finally, the, the, one of the big things to come indirectly or directly out of the Leveson Quarry was the closure of the News of the World. In hindsight, do you think that was the right thing to have happened? Um, well, obviously anybody who worked, worked there, I, mean, I, I, was, I was there long before the phone hacking era, but in fact, anybody who worked there obviously feels very embittered about what happened, and I think, I can understand that feeling, because I think the closure probably had as much, if not more, to do with the fact that uh, News Corp was still hoping at that stage to make a successful bid to take over the rest, of, to buy up the rest of Sky, and that that was the real motivation for the closure. As it happened, of course, as the Dowler outrage grew, that they had to withdraw that bid anyway. And, but, uh, and I wonder if that decision would necessarily have been taken if it wasn't for the B Sky B bid at the time. Um, but uh, also, it was probably the, the decision, probably the right one for News Corp mm. at, that, at that time, whether it was the best thing for... Uh, you know, for plurality of newspaper choice is a different matter. Paul, we've got to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you very much. Paul Conyu uh, from St Albans, former deputy editor of the News of the World and is now a media consultant. Uh, we're going to go to Diane in Langford. Good morning, Diane. Good morning. You are. You heard Ron in Luton earlier on who put yes. out the challenge that nobody has checkbooks anymore. Do you have a checkbook? Of course I do. Of course I you do. I have a regular checkbook because how would... How would um... Oh... No, it's kind of uh, charities yeah. survive otherwise. We were only talking about this the other day, a friend and I. Yeah. She sends checks for charities. I do. We pick out each month which ones we're going to do. Oh. And it's checks, but not the same one every month because you can't afford it. How do you choose which one you're going to send a check to? Well, it's all according to what it is. Right. What was the last one you sent? Uh, World Wildlife. Okay, there you go. So you, you, you kind of uh, the, the favour towards animals, but you've got to check. Oh, I am favoured towards animals because they you. can't talk. Sorry. They can't talk, can they? They cannot talk. Yes, that's that's one thing I've noticed about them. No, well done for you. Good work. <laughs> uh, so you you think that Ron is talking nonsense and that checks uh, are, are in and most people have checkbooks? Yes, because what you don't keep money in the house, not these days. Because it's, it's dangerous. If anybody breaks in and finds it, then that's it. It's gone. Diane, thank you very much. Talk about not keeping money in the house. I found in my car, my little boy's two and a half. He's got like a little sort of like purse thing that he puts coins in and he likes to think he's like the big man, right? I found it in my car. I had a look in there. He's two and a half. He had seven quid in there. The thing is, it's my seven quid. What he does is he finds money that's fallen out of my pocket or on my bedside table and he just has it. So I've, I've taken it from him. Oh, I've got that back. Don't you worry about that. Across beds, hearts and bugs, this is BBC Three Counties Radio. You're, you're all being very kind um, discussing my lawnmower problems. and I, but This is the ongoing theme. We're doing all these huge stories, but the lawnmower is the one that seems to grab your attention. Someone has phoned up to offer me their lawnmower for £40. Very kind of you. Uh, but the, the laws of broadcasting forbid me from buying any lawnmowers from listeners. Uh, but th- it's very kind of you. Thank you very much. I'm always surprised by the things that grab uh, your attention. Uh, a young poet. Oh, this is a nice story, isn't it? A young poet from Hertfordshire will have his work on display in the Olympic Park over the Summer Games. 22-year-old uh, Anthony Adels from St Albans won a competition run by the National Lottery to join 12 other poets in writing the piece. He's now getting ready to see his work go on show to the world. Our reporter, Sophie Solaria, went to meet Anthony at his parents' home in St Albans to hear about the experience. Anthony, thank you for letting me into your beautiful home in St Albans. You're a poet from Hertfordshire. I bet you never imagined to be involved in the biggest sporting event in the UK. No, I mean, I was one of those kids who couldn't catch at school uh, for years and years and years, so I'm slightly baffled that I've ended up doing things towards the Olympics. It's quite nice. And so now tell us about your involvement with the Olympics. How did that come about? Well because this is, is the 21st century and 22, it all happened because of Facebook. <laughs> I got involved with a, a programme based at the Barbican, uh, called the Barbican Young Poets, which is run by a man called Jacob Samuel Rose. Um, one of the things that he sent out a link to was this opportunity for the uh, 12 Poets of 2012 programme, and they asked for 500 words on the similarities between poetry and sporting endeavour, and I looked at that and thought, I can't think of anything that, that links those two, and, and didn't think anything more about it. And then a little while later thought, well, there's this and this and this. What was this and this and this? 
when you when you're trying to get better and better at sports or poetry or probably most things no matter how good you've got you'll always find the next thing that you can improve to to up your game slightly to make you feel like you're you're slightly more in control and that both of them are in a sense they are about that control over a skill but also that you can't really hide if you're doing sports at a very high level or, or writing and was that your inspiration for the poem the way we went about writing the poem, because there were, there were 12 of us, is the National Lottery had organised each of us to go and interview, uh, interview an Olympic hopeful. And we each sort of came to the table with what we'd thought about for the initial sort of 500 words brief, but also what we you know, brought out of those conversations with the athletes. So who did you meet? What athletes did you get introduced to? Um, I met a badminton player called uh, Rajiv Youssef, who was picked for the Olympic Games, and he's the UK's... Uh, number one men's singles player and he, he was really really nice I went to the uh, Babbitton Centre at Milton Keynes um, and we also talked about sort of the whole the huge army of, of people that you never see who are involved in really high level sports you know the coaches the video technicians people doing all these peculiar very specific jobs that no one ever really hears about and did that conversation reflect in your final poem I think it did because one of the things that we decided was important was that we wanted the poem to not just be about people who win medals at the Olympic Games. We wanted it to reflect the fact that there's all the athletes, all the people who are supporting the athletes, whether that's professionally or whether that's family or whether that's friends or even just people who turn up to watch. And that actually we wanted whatever we wrote to to sort of engage with that and, and celebrate everyone who's involved rather than just the athletes, though obviously they're quite important too. I think what's interesting about the Olympics is the way that it has engaged all sorts of people across the United Kingdom, whether that's because they're grumbling about it or whether that's because they're really enthusiastic about it. And all sorts of different people, all sorts of age groups, and that's really something, you know, that's really something to be celebrated, I think. You are the perfect parabola of each envisioned leap, the interlinking rings, the ligaments, elastic lungs. Believe, believe in the red-haired girl with gold on her mind. Once kiss chased and kicking leaves, now a flame breathing to ignite another. Become full of chance as the national lottery. Become the one who reaches deep inside the sky, fights gravity like paper planes, and breathes. There we go, fantastic stuff. Anthony's poem, Breathe, will be on display in the Olympic Park uh, from Friday. <clears throat> and it's amazing, isn't it, how all these different um, things are kind of coming together. It starts on Friday, the Olympics! It's mad! It's all happening. 08459 455 555. Don't forget, Justin Dealey is filling in for Jonathan uh, this morning at 9 o'clock and uh, he'll be talking more about um, the the cash-in-hand story that we've been talking about. But now, the man accused of killing 12 people at a cinema in Colorado has been warned he could face the death penalty. James Holmes, 24, made his initial court appearance in Centennial where he was refused bail. Holmes is accused of killing 12 people and injuring 59 as he opened fire at a midnight screening of the new Batman film on Friday. Speaking after the hearing, the district attorney leading the prosecution team, Carol Chambers, said any decision about whether they would press for the death penalty in the case will be made after consulting the victims and their families. There's so much that victims have to take into account and victims will be impacted by that decision in an enormous way for years. If the death penalty is sought, that's a very long process that impacts their lives for years. And so we will want to get their input before we make any kind of a decision on that. Our US reporter, James Gordon, can bring us up to date with the latest on the court appearance and the investigation. James, what happened in court? Well, this was the most bizarre scene in the Colorado courtroom yesterday. The public got its first glimpse of James Holmes, the 24-year-old gunman, since he was arrested and uh, amid the mayhem of Friday's shooting. And he looked as though he, if he, the, uh, he hadn't slept since then. He appeared dazed and confused. His hair was a complete mess. This flame-red, comic book-coloured red hair, a really dazed look about him. And his eyes, at times, were wide open, offering an almost stunned expression, and then, at other times, seemingly struggling to keep them open or to stay awake. He went from one extreme to the other, from bulging eyes and then to sloping forward in his chair as if he was about to fall asleep. And in the front row, the parents and friends of the victims were left studying his face. The bright red hair was described, I've heard it in loads of descriptions uh, from the survivors, how terrifying it was. Whose decision would it have been for him to show up in court like that? 
I think that was certainly his decision. Um, it was likely how he was arrested. It's what he looked like at the time. And of course, you know, you have to ask, why would he want to change? Um, you know, he might be playing a very clever game where he can appear to have this mental defect, uh, which would be useful in any kind of defence in a court case that would be coming up. Um, I mean, he was either extremely tired or there is some serious mental defect or he's faking it. And this is what the court and jury will have to determine in the months ahead. And, and James, how is the investigation proceeding? Well, it seems to be going OK. I mean, the FBI uh, were unable to get into Holmes's flat for two days because he'd booby-trapped the place with... 30 artillery shells um there was also trip wires around the perimeter of the room so it took them a couple of days before they were able able to enter but now they say that they've retrieved various uh, pieces of evidence including a computer which could provide some crucial details and they found various sort of orders of 6,000 rounds of ammunition um those four guns of course uh, two rifles and two pistols and cartridges for a pump action shotgun they found all of those kinds of things. Um, so it's obvious that uh, Holmes was acting with calculation and deliberation, according to the Colorado police. The interesting thing is, is that this man never, ever was in trouble with the law, apart from a speeding fine last year. James, thank you very much. That's James Gordon, uh, our US reporter. And it, 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 we'll hear more of this story as it goes on. And it, it's, um, it's a flippant word to use, but it is, it is fascinating, isn't it? And I don't mean that in any disrespectful way to those that have lost their lives. Um, but it's just, it's just so out of the ordinary and so incomprehensible, I guess, that someone could do something like that in a cinema, you know, a place that we've all, we've all been to the pictures. It's, it's, it's one of the, you know, it's one of those places where you go and it's dark and it's safe and it's fine. It's just incomprehensible, I think, is the word I'm looking for. Uh, we've got a text on the Olympics from Mike. TFL are flying by their seat at the seat of their pants. London will be clogged up, as all Londoners will know. I thought the TFL guy that we had on was good. I thought he put forward a good argument. It'd be interesting to speak to him after the Olympics to see, uh, you know, maybe they will get it. It's going to be busy in London. There's going to be, what is it? I think it's something like 7 billion extra people coming or something. I may have got that figure slightly wrong. But it's going to be busy in London. There's no way around it. Um, but th- it'd be interesting to see how this goes in terms of the traffic and whether TFL, they might get some, they might get it right, mightn't they? It's possible, isn't it? You don't think so? Oh, OK, we'll see. Oh, wait, 459 four double five five double five. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 8.45 on Tuesday, the 23rd of July. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Commuters in the three counties are being told to prepare travel plans ahead of the Olympics, which start on Friday. Train company First Capital Connect are predicting delays despite over 760,000 extra seats. And on the roads, the Hearts County show ground at Redbourne will be a park and ride base for game spectators. A Hertfordshire MP and Conservative Treasury Minister has accused householders who pay tradesmen in cash in return for a discount of being morally wrong. South West Hearts MP David Gork says such arrangements are helping people to avoid paying tax. In sport, in last night's football friendlies, Luton won 2-0 at St Albans and Milton Keynes Dons won 2-0 in Ireland against St James's Gate. The weather for beds, hearts and bucks dry with long spells of unbroken sunshine and feeling hot once again. The day's maximum temperature, 29 degrees Celsius. Coming up, more than three million of us are off on our holidays this summer, which means that a lot of valuables will be left unattended in our homes. Next, we'll hear from our reporter who's been to meet a reformed burglar. And Justin Dealey sits in for JVS from Nine. He's asking, is paying cash in hand morally wrong? Yeah. Justin Dealey filling in for Jonathan this morning. Uh, and the, I'm a big fan of Justin, so it will definitely be worth uh, a listen. We were talking about the Leveson inquiry. Today is probably the last day of Leveson. Um, and Peter in Warmer Green has called in. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Peter, what's your take on all of this? Well, my take, uh, even if there's nothing else discovered... I think the slime that they've dragged out, if you like, during the course of the Livingston Inquiry is the main thing. Because from my, from my point of view, there's been so much slime exposed, it's done a great job. There's a lot of slime in journalism, uh, politicians, and, it, and to me, if the Livingston Inquiry done nothing else, it's dragged out the 
terrible state of what's been going on in this country. And, and we, a lot of people didn't know it. I think that we've always known that the, the press can be a little underhand. That's how they get some of their stories. But uh, uh, even I uh, have been shocked by some of the methods that they have resorted to and some of the levels that they have sunk to in, in the recent past? Well, well, I, I mean, I'm looking at it across the board, and we're not ju- I'm not just talking about what's been exposed in that. Yeah. But if it stops uh, in other areas, things in other areas, that's f- that, that should happen as well. Mm. There are so many slimy areas now in this country, I'm beginning to not regard us as a democracy. We keep talking about other democracies but we're we're gradually losing it here without any shadow of a doubt and uh, if we don't all sort of sit up and take notice and say look not in my name i mean if we're letting it go then there's something radically wrong with our society, basically. Sp- the, uh, the speaking specifically about the press, I know that the, the police and the politicians have, have come out with, with slightly um, tainted images. Peter, do you think that the press should be more tightly regulated? Well, cer- certainly. I don't, want them, I don't want them locked down. Totally. Right. But what I want to happen, I don't want them to have, if you like, too much power in pushing people in one direction Politically, this is what's been happening in this country. This country now, if you've got a newspaper that's totally and utterly for one party, I would make it illegal for them to uh, be politically biased. OK, so, uh, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Peter's upset at the amount of slime, as he says, uh, that has, uh, has come out as a result of the Leveson inquiry. Ah, OK. A survey suggests that more than three million of us will go abroad this summer, leaving our belongings uninsured and at risk of being stolen. The latest crime stats show that both petty theft and burglary has increased. Our reporter, Gareth Lloyd, has been to meet Steve Cattell, a former career criminal in Hertfordshire, to find out how you can keep your things safe this summer. So, Steve, uh, a former ex-career criminal, what, what does that mean, a career criminal? What, what were you doing? Um, anything from burglary, so armed robberies, drug dealing. Um, really anything that, um, basically was, uh, criminal activity and, uh, was illegal. Was that taking up all your life? I started, um, I started committing burglaries when I was eight. And, um, obviously, you know, stealing from shops and, and small petty things like that. And it just graduated, um, and I went to, basically... I suppose the College of uh, Crime, which was uh, eventually was prison. And every time uh, it goes right, you, you, you steal what you wanted. Do you then get more confidence to move on to a bigger place until eventually you look at a property and go, I can get inside here? Um, any property that I actually ever saw, um, I really never got defeated. I would always be able to get inside it. So there weren't particular buildings you actually looked for or things that you looked out for? Um, In the early days it would have been houses and then I graduated onto flats where obviously there was more cover because you was off off the road and people obviously couldn't see you because you had an outer door to shut. Um, But yeah, I would target um, different houses at different times of the year. I mean, we're now sitting in the summer. um, So... It being the summer, I could possibly be walking uh, around and find people in their garden with their door open, doing their gardening, and obviously uh, a distraction could be made while somebody actually went in through the, their front door. Um, there was all different types of, of, of crimes which would become available that you didn't think was available. Uh, interestingly, your house, uh, your, your front door protected by some beautiful trees, on one hand offering you, your family, protection from a road and, and you don't have to see cars and lorries going past, but on the other hand, I guess, maybe then that, that protection for a criminal to, to have a bit more time to, to uh, approach from the front door. You know... I'm, I'm, you can't win, can you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised uh, that we haven't been burgled yet. But um, I do say that, basically, on my website, you know, tips on how to beat the burglar, you know, to have um, PVC windows um, that can be pretty difficult to get in. 
um, and we have been targeted quite a number of times because we are an entrance here for um, other burglars to get into back gardens. Um, I've woke up in the morning and found uh, a crowbar on my back uh, patio, um, screwdrivers on my back patio. My next door neighbour he's, he's been tried to have his door levered in. Um, but me personally, uh, I would use the noise distraction and uh, basically just uh, smash smash a window because of the noise. And the speed there. Summer month then, so we're in the hottest week maybe of the year yeah. we're going to witness. I want to leave my window open at night. I want to leave, uh, you know, uh, windows slightly ajar downstairs. That's, is that safe or is there ways of doing that that make it safer? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that anybody leave their windows downstairs open. I wouldn't recommend anybody upstairs leave their windows upstairs open if, 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 if a person could actually make access to that window upstairs. Well, for most of us, leaving keys with a neighbour whilst we're away might seem like a sensible option, but according to some insurers, doing something like that could invalidate your home and contents insurance if your home is then broken into. Uh, We've got John Guy on the line. He's an insurance journalist. Good morning, John. Good morning. John, most people think that getting comprehensive insurance covers them against the nightmare of finding their home ransacked, but that's not true, is it? Well, uh, it it is, but of course, the the thing about insurance is it is a contract between two parties, you and the insurer. Therefore, you have a duty of um, care to take reasonable care of your property and ensure that it is is secure. And of course, this is where, as you quite rightly say, um, this is where we get into the grey area of of what insurers would deem to be um, secure or not. But everyone leaves a key with a neighbour. When I go away, I give a key to a young girl who comes in and feeds the cat and the fish. Well, yes, and I mean, to be quite honest, um, you know, for many insurers, it's sort of standard advice to ask sort of a trusted relative, neighbour or friend to keep an eye on your home when you're on holiday. But the thing about it, of course, a lot of them will say, if you plan to leave a key with your neighbour, you know, for for example, to feed your pets while you're away, then obviously providing they lock it up, lock lock up and make the property secure when they leave, then I can't, you know, I mean, most of them would, wouldn't, would not see that as a problem. Of course, the issue being is, if, if for some reason, the, you know, it, the, the problem r- runs in, if, if they, of course, don't lock up, and they forget, and they go and feed the cat, and then come out and, and forget to lock the door, yeah. and then, of course, suddenly, the, the, the homeowner's in a situation, well, how do they get in? Well, they open the front door. Well, therefore, your house wasn't properly secured, you yeah. were in, you were in Ibiza or Marbella, um, yeah, and, and unfortunately, you know, that, that's not, they would not deem that as reasonable care. Uh, John, what things should people be mindful of in case they break their insurance guarantees? I mean, the, the, the one thing, and every piece of advice um, I would always give is, mate, you know, if, if it is an issue, if you do look at that, you can always check with your insurer. The, you know, if you can find the insurer and say, look, am I covered if I leave my, you know, if I leave my key with the, with the neighbour? And of course, and I know it's, it's horrible, but check your policy. Yeah. Also, if you're using a broker, the broker broker should, you know, if you are actually using a broker to, um, to get your insurance policy, ask them and say, well, actually, you know, are there any, are there any um, caveats on this policy that I should be made aware of in terms of what, what, what may well look at a, a, an exclusion that you and I would not seem to be, that you and I would not actually think of, such as, such as actually if you leave it with a neighbour. It's all about the policy. Unfortunately, it's a legal document, and, and like everything else, unfortunately, the devil is so often in the detail with these things. John, you've got to earn nice for your holidays this year. Uh, no, I'm, I'm off. I'm off down to. Um, I'm off down to the south coast, and I will be locking my doors. It's nice down there. It's, it's good the south coast. Yeah, it, it is. I'm looking down. I'm looking. Um, I'm going down for the sailing for the Olympics. Fantastic, so. John. Listen, thank you very much, John Guy, an insurance journalist. There. We all just assume that we're covered and everything's safe, don't we? Look, we've got a few texts. Let's rattle through these before uh, Justin comes on. Um, this is c- sort of about this, but not quite. Uh, a few weeks... But this is a terrifying story. A few weeks back, my granddaughter was in holes in Greece, woke up to find a masked man in her room. He took her money and iPhone. He escaped by the balcony. There were two more trying to pick the lock of her friends next door. What do you do if you wake up and there's a masked man in your room and it's not a service that you've paid for? Um, a text about the Olympics. All the miseries that have been calling in need to get a life. Olympics are a celebration of excellence and should be embraced. As for game, games lanes, no lanes, no games. That's a good little slogan. No lanes, no games. It's only 30 miles. It's two weeks of inconvenience in 48 years. 
And we've had seven years to get used to it. Should be a fantastic occasion for everyone, especially the youth of the country, and an inspiration. If you are planning anything else on Friday night, cancel it. I saw a preview of the opening ceremony last night. It is simply stunning. Well done, Danny Boyle. Looking forward to seeing that. Also, on Sunday, August the 7th, I'm having a Kids' Olympics in my house. Yeah, totally. My kids, my niece and nephew, they're all coming round. We're having a Kids' Olympics. It's going to be Greece versus New Zealand. It'll be fantastic. That's it. I'm back tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Thank you very much for sticking around and listening. Uh, Jonathan Vernon-Smith is not in this morning, so Justin Dealey will be filling in and no doubt doing a superb job. I'll be back tomorrow at 6. Until then, ta-ta. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio.